Makes sense. There's another. We just check the.
Uh, I'm live. Yeah. What? Who are you guys with? Sky. Who are you with? Oh, uh, Royce. I'm afraid you don't get that shot. Um, I think we need to be there. Yeah. Um, Didn't she say in something <laughs> that the pool camera is going to be here? Yeah. Or I, think, I think if she dies. One hit. Worst case scenario, you know. Get my to give it to you. Where did where did you get that umbrella on? <laughs> pretty much. It's, it's pretty cool. cool. <laughs> That's all we have. Uh -huh, right. Good wet. Oh, yeah. so give it half an hour and you will be the same. <laughs> so when I'm still wet from Tuesday, so we're up there. Oh, right. <laughs> I took it to the pool then. That <laughs> 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 The whole situation is going to move because we've got all of our But until that is good. So, in a couple of hours, what's going to happen? Once it's time, once it's time, let's just start organising all of the things. Oh, there's two of those. All of the things. Oh, okay.
Not bad. Uh, have you seen, seen everything on, um, going on? Yeah, okay. I haven't got much of it yet. Do you hear the one helicopter around? Cool. Hello from Perth. That's Perth. Do you yeah. hear the helicopter? Nice one. Okay, I'll give a shout um, back. Okay? I've, I've been here since. But all the cars coming and going were empty.
Are you looking for the trip to the trip? Wait, Phil's coming at half eight, we can do all that then. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, he's he's playing playing the other, the other, the other, the other, the other, Yeah, we, we have to get this going get and stuff. Anyway, um, I've heard of this one that's the same. So, you know, you know, you know, it's the same. 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 It's the same.
you were looking live at the gates of Balmoral Castle in Scotland, where Queen Elizabeth II's health has taken a serious turn for the worse. Doctors have her under what they're calling supervision. The Queen's children and grandchildren are en route to see her as we come on the air. Hello, I'm Libby Casey. Welcome to this special report from The Washington Post. Queen Elizabeth is 96 years old and her health has been on the decline for several years. There is concern across the United Kingdom and the globe. Joining me right now, we'll talk with uh, our royal correspondent, a royal reporter, Sarah Hewson. Sarah Hewson, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, Sarah, what do we know about the Queen's condition? Sarah Hewson, can you hear me? We'll see if we can get Sarah Hewson on the line soon. In the meantime, we have James Homan with me here in the newsroom. Also, Hannah Jewell. Uh, James, we'll start with you. You know, there is, of course, the concern over how the Queen's doctors are categorizing her health. But there's also uh, this concern because her family is traveling to be by her side. That's Why are right, those both Libby. significant? Both are, are very significant. This is a, a woman who is in her late 90s, uh, who was celebrated just a few months ago at her uh, latest jubilee. Uh, but she uh, has not returned from Scotland, where she has been now uh, for a little while. And uh, the fact that the family is going and that the doctors have put out this highly unusual statement uh, are, has put all of the United Kingdom on high alert. So Hannah Jewell, 96 years old, of course, a remarkable age. And the Queen just celebrated a very important anniversary of her reign. Tell us more. So that's right, Libby. This summer, um, the British people celebrated the Queen's um, 70th anniversary of her coronation, um, her taking the throne in 1953. This was um, known as the Platinum Jubilee, and the public got two extra days off work to celebrate it with lots of fanfare, lots of parades and so on, and pomp and circumstance, um, which really drove home this incredible length of time upon the throne. Of course, this is the queen who has seen 15 prime ministers, starting with Winston Churchill, who was born in 1874. So if you think about it that way, she's really spanned a, a century and a half of, of history in some ways. Um, and uh, we saw her most recently um, looking sort of well but frail um, as she helped to appoint the new prime minister, Liz Truss, um, inviting her formally um, in Scotland to form a new government. Um, this moment is, is so significant, Libby, because, you know, as much as Americans love the Queen, um, this is such a, a deep part of the British psyche for, for most people in Britain, um, seeing just not, of course, their, their feelings for, about the Queen, but um, the, the significance of this long history since the 1950s, this, this long arc of 20th century history for which she was ever present as, uh, as so much else changed. Let's go now to Sarah Hewson, royal reporter. Uh, Sarah, you have covered uh, Queen Elizabeth for so long. What do we know about her health situation today? Yes, I have. Uh, Libby, I'm in fact, I just returned from Balmoral yesterday where I had been covering her visit from Boris Johnson, the outgoing prime minister, and Liz Truss, the incoming prime minister. And when we saw the image of the Queen standing in the drawing room at Balmoral Castle, I think most of us breathed a small sigh of relief because we hadn't seen sight of her since July when she first travelled to Balmoral and we knew that there were health complications that had prevented her from attending the Highland Games, which is one of her favourite events, but also a sense of foreboding of how frail she looked. She was standing, she was using a stick, she looked very frail, although she looked in good spirits and she was beaming at the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss. So when the news came through today, the statement from Buckingham Palace, although it is not a surprise, it still comes as a shock somehow, doesn't it? Because the Queen has represented constant and continuity and stability to the British nation for so long. She's 96 years old and she has still been working. She was still doing her red box. Her red boxes, her government business on Tuesday, she felt very determined that she should be a part of that very important constitutional duty, seeing the smooth transition from one head of government to another. But it is very serious. And I think the fact that Buckingham Palace issued this statement, an unprecedented and rare statement, 
told us that things were not looking good. Now, and sir, then sir, the statement is, is members of the royal family travelling there urgently made us realise quite how serious it was. And the statement from Buckingham Palace is quite short. It just says, following further evaluation this morning, the Queen's doctors are concerned for Her Majesty's health and have recommended she remain under medical supervision. The Queen remains comfortable and at Balmoral. Uh, there's a lot that's unsaid there, um, but perhaps even more significantly is the fact, as you were just saying before I interrupted you, that her family is going to join her. Yes, and in fact, um, just a short time ago, we saw... Uh, Prince William, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward and his wife Sophie, the Countess of Wessex, landing at Aberdeen Airport. They had flown there on an RAS flight to Aberdeen Airport. It's about an hour's drive from Aberdeen to Balmoral, should they drive, rather than take a helicopter. Um, and then the family will gather at the Queen's side. And, and although we see this um, very much as a moment of national and international importance, I think that is a poignant reminder that this is a moment of, for a family as well, a family coming together and a moment of extreme difficulty for the family. Let's bring in London Bureau Chief William Booth. Uh, Bill, uh, give us a sense of how the United Kingdom is, is reacting in this moment. You know, I, I think Sarah said it so well that while not a surprise, it, there is an element of shock. Yeah, I mean, I think that's quite true. Um, the, the first statement to the press uh, came around uh, uh, 1230 uh, uh, midday at lunch, just after the new prime minister, Liz Truss, was introducing her new energy bill uh, to save uh, British families from very, very high energy prices. And, and the ripple went throughout uh, the Palace of Westminster and through, uh, through government offices. Um, Truss tweeted within two or three minutes. Uh, that she was very concerned, and then others quickly followed. Um, the Queen, as everyone notes, is 96. She's been in not great health, frail health. Uh, but she was standing, you know, on Tuesday with a cane and not looking fantastic, but looking pretty good for a 96-year-old. So I think this has taken people by surprise. They think, uh, they think, I, I think they thought that they would have the Queen longer. We'll see. Um, uh, she's a robust uh, woman, and, and, and we don't really know what's going to happen in the coming hours or days. But but Britain is is knocked back a bit on its heels. It's um, uh, it's not freaking out at this particular moment, but um, uh, it's ready for the next bit of news that comes when it comes. Bill, what is the news coverage there like right now? Give us a sense of uh, how how newscasters are are covering it in in London and and in Great Britain. Well, newscasters are kind of going full tilt um, and, and um, dramatically uh, some of the BBC presenters started appearing on camera in sort of a black, a black jacket or a black tie. Uh, and me and my colleagues went, oh my God, it's happened. We just don't know it yet. But um, uh, all the, the BBC programming has been scratched for the evening. Um, all the news uh, papers and, and, and websites are going sort of uh, all on on the Queen at this at this particular moment. Um, Sarah, if you're still with us over the phone, can you give us yeah. a sense of of you know how significant this Queen is in terms of the lives of you know everyday people where you live? I mean, most people in the United Kingdom and beyond have only known this one Queen. Yes, um, we've just celebrated seven decades of her reign, Britain's longest serving monarch, the second longest serving monarch in the world. I think you can't to comprehend, I'm sorry, if you can hear interferences because I'm on a flight. Um, but it is hard to comprehend the significance of this. Um, you think of Britain and you think of the Queen and the majority of us will have known no other monarch. She's the backdrop to our lives, really. She represents so much more than just the crown and the monarchy. She's been a constant... Um, she is the person that, during the COVID pandemic, for example, during times of crisis, she is the person that the nation has turned to. She gave a very powerful speech at the peak of the COVID pandemic, saying, we will meet again. And it, there was a clamouring for people to hear from the Queen to bring them together. And so I think 
although we have known that this moment would come at some point, there is still a sense of shock and nobody could really imagine what it would be like the end of the, the second Elizabethan era, if that is what we are seeing unfold. Of course, we don't know, but it does seem very serious indeed that the family have now gathered at Balmoral to be with her, following that statement and also statements in the House of Commons, uh, statements from the Prime Minister, from the Archbishop of Canterbury as well. The news at this hour is that the royal family is gathering at the Queen's bedside and she is under medical supervision. Sarah, how unusual is it for the royal family to gather like this? I mean, they really dropped everything to get to Balmoral Castle. Yes, now some of the royal family were in, already in Scotland because it is the annual summer break. The Queen is usually there from late July until October. Princess Anne happened to be in Scotland conducting engagements. The Prince of Wales uh, and the Duchess of Cornwall were also in Scotland uh, at Dumfries House, their property there. So they were able to get to Balmoral fairly quickly. But then we know that seven members of the Royal Household uh, took an RAF flight from RAF Northolt in London to Aberdeen. Prince William, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward and his wife Sophie were on board and now making their way to Balmoral, uh, the family really coming together. Also, Harry and Meghan, they were due to be conducting an engagement in London this evening uh, for a charity event that has been cancelled. We and Sunday are also on their way to the Balmoral estate. Uh, Hannah Jewell, let's go to you. I mean, to see Harry and Meghan uh, head there uh, is certainly significant and gives us a sense of the gravity of the situation. But talk to us about the backdrop of the relationships of the royal family, Hannah. Well, of course, uh, there has been this tension between the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, and the, the rest of the royal family um, over the last few years as they have sort of cut ties, moved to Los Angeles, um, and, and sort of renounced a lot of their formal royal duties. Um, it's actually unclear right now if Meghan is going up. Um, Harry certainly is on his way to um, the Queen's bedside. Um, it is uh, not known why that is. The two were already in Britain um, by chance for the uh, Well Child Awards, which is a children's charity serving um, children with serious illnesses. Um, we know that all four of the Queen's children are there. Um, we know the Prince William, Prince Edward, Sophie the Countess of Wessex, who is um, Edward's wife, Prince Andrew, have all been seen arriving at Aberdeen Airport. Um, it's certainly a moment where that tension will perhaps be put aside as a grandson can be by the bedside of his grandmother at the end of the day. Um, I, I'm not sure how the, the British press will take uh, this sort of, um, will read between the tea leaves, read the tea leaves of this um, if it is in fact the case that um, one is there and not the other. Um, but I think that this will also not be top of mind for most people as they are uh, digesting this news um, of the Queen's poor health and um, what we are waiting to hear today about how she's doing. So, Bill Booth, uh, can you talk to us more about the relationships of the royal family and, uh, and, and what you'll be watching and the significance of them all going there together? Well, the royal family is fairly dysfunctional. I mean, at, at present, um, Prince Andrew is still a bit of an outcast. He's not in the public eye. Um, Prince Charles is kind of steady as he goes, and he is the heir in waiting. Uh, Harry and Meghan are a different story. Um, they have, uh, as Hannah was talking about, uh, they have left for California, and they are leading kind of a different life. The British public doesn't really like Harry and Meghan, especially Meghan so much anymore. I think the U.S. audiences uh, appreciate them more and appreciate what they're doing and they have their kind of journey away from the royal family more. Um, they'll all come together. I mean, this is a family that is kind of bulletproof in many ways. I mean, they'll come together with the Queen and they'll, they'll all go to Balmoral and they will um, stand together uh, for the eventual funeral, um, whenever that is. I mean, um, uh, they know how the game works, and they know how to put on uh, these uh, this, this pageantry and this um, uh, this not exactly a show, but something like a show, as they did for the 70th Jubilee. I mean, they will um, they'll carry on. Um, that is uh, that is what they were uh, born to do, and that's what the Queen trained them to do or taught them to do uh, throughout their entire lives. Um 
James, let's talk a little bit about what happens when the queen does die. Um, because as Bill was saying, there there is a procedure, there is a protocol, and there really is pageantry around uh, such a passage and such a significant death uh, for the royal family. So talk to us about what happens next. They call it Operation London Bridge. The queen's death is perhaps the most planned for event in the world, uh, and it has been literally for decades. Uh, there have been practices and rehearsals. There are many people uh, who have focused uh, literally their life's work on preparing for the scenario of the queen's death. Operation London Bridge is closely connected to what's also called Operation Spring Tide, which is Charles's ascendancy to the throne. Essentially, all the planning levy comes down to 10 days. Uh, the clock starts once the queen dies. Uh, there is basically a, a calling tree for the prime minister and various cabinet officials to be notified uh, and told to keep it discreet. Uh, the day after the queen dies, Charles will be declared king. The second day, the body of the queen uh, would be carried from Balmoral in Scotland, which we're seeing a, a live picture of right now, to London. Uh, there is an open question of whether it will be via uh, a royal train or by an RAF plane. Uh, they have planned for both scenarios. On the third day after the Queen died, uh, King Charles would, would embark on a tour across the United Kingdom. On the fourth day, the coffin of the Queen will go to Westminster Hall, uh, and Charles will go to Northern Ireland. On the fifth day, there will be a procession from Buckingham Palace to the Palace of Westminster with a service at Westminster Hall. On the sixth day, there will be a, a dress rehearsal for the big state funeral. On the seventh day, Charles will go to Wales and attend a service in Cardiff. Part of the planning is designed to uh, prevent everyone in the kingdom from descending on London. So there are going to be services around uh, the, the, the kingdom uh, so that not everyone descends on London. And then the final big event, uh, 10 days after the queen dies, will be the state funeral, which will happen at Westminster Abbey. There will be two minutes of silence across the nation right at midday at noon. And then there will be a committal service, a burial at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. Bill Booth, you know, it, it, talk to us about that expectation. I mean, you know, there is this built-up effort, as James was talking about, to prepare for this day, and it is really astounding just how much will go into this ceremonial procedure that goes on for days, and is really two things happening, right? The queen and her passing, and a new king, Bill. Uh, yes, and, um, and as we were saying, I mean... Um, you know, the minute the queen dies, uh, Charles uh, becomes king. Um, he doesn't have to wait for a coronation. That's the way um, hereditary monarchy will work. Um, there is, uh, this is this is elaborately planned uh, 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 event. Um, thousands of pages have been uh, typed up about this and, and written both for the BBC and the international news bureaus like ours, and of course the government. Um, uh, a lot is riding on the continuation of the monarchy. The monarchy signals for Britain's stability. Uh, it, it's, it's great for tourism, but it's, it's, it's super for brand England, uh, brand Britain. Um, uh, it will go on for, as you said, for 10 days. Uh, Charles will take kind of a road trip uh, after the queen passes and, be, and, 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 and before her funeral that he'll show himself uh, to the people as, as king. And it will, I'm very interested in, in how the people see Charles as king. I mean, he's 73 years old. They've always seen him as the sort of uh, the, the first son, but the understudy uh, to Queen Elizabeth II. Um, you know, will they have the same warm feelings for, for Charles they have for, for Elizabeth? I mean, we'll see. They, they probably won't. Um, Charles is a more controversial figure because he says stuff and he has opinions about the environment and architecture and art and, and building and all sorts of things. And he's lived a long life uh, and, and, and has um, all sorts of charities and trusts and associations. So, so he has a long uh, record of, of doing and saying things that some people like and you know, most people like and a few, some people don't like. 
Um, so it's not like the queen who reveals very little uh, beyond the uh, power of the, the monarch. Um, so it'll be fascinating to see. The people will mourn the queen's passing. I think uh, that will be uh, very clear and, and, and emotional, not in the same way it probably was for Princess Diana. Uh, she is, after all, 96. Nothing be sudden about this. Um, but we'll see how uh, Charles does. We'll see, we'll see whether the people like this idea of a monarchy mm. and how lo much longer they want to keep it going. Let's bring Rhonda Colvin into the conversation. You know, Rhonda, people in the United Kingdom certainly uh, have a connection to and strong feelings about the royal family, but it's people outside of the UK who have uh, an attachment to Queen Elizabeth in particular. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, this is such a, a significant moment in geopolitical history that even those outside of the UK and outside of the Commonwealth will really feel this uh, whenever an announcement may be made. Um, she's been around longer uh, than most world leaders. In fact, she has met all living U.S. presidents, uh, starting with Truman and with the exception of Lyndon Johnson. So she's been a constant to a lot of Americans who have watched her, watched her family uh, expand through the years. And, you know, during her time as queen, she has withstood, um, you know, a lot of ebbs and flows of the popularity of the monarchy, uh, just like our colleague was just saying. But outside of the UK, there, there often has been, um, you know, popular feelings and sentiment toward the monarchy. So I expect that uh, when any sort of announcement is made, you'll hear an outpouring of sympathy from a lot of Americans and also our, our leaders here in the United States. Uh, Hannah, let's talk about the Queen's role, uh, n not just as someone we think of guiding uh, England, guiding Great Britain, but also as essentially the head of state for other countries as well. Tell us about her relationship with other nations. So the Queen is the head of state, of course, of, of the United Kingdom, but also of 15 Commonwealth countries outside of the UK. She was actually touring the Commonwealth. She was in Kenya when she learned that her father had died and that she would be becoming queen much sooner than she'd anticipated in 1952. Um, and of course, the head of state is in, in Britain in a constitutional monarchy is, is largely a ceremonial one, um, but it's a very sig symbolically significant one. We saw this with her earlier this, this week, um, on just on Tuesday, two days ago. Um, playing her role in formally um, appointing the next prime minister, Liz Truss. Um, and, but you see more broadly um, mixed feelings about the queen, about, about the, the royal family, about continuing such a relationship. It's actually a number of Caribbean countries that have looked to sort of sever ties to, to have a president rather than have the queen continue as a head of state. Um, but her, her really global impact, um, and, and indeed the mourning, will be a global one, as Rhonda was saying. Um, but uh, And to Britain, too, uh, losing its head of state of such a long time is such a symbolically huge moment, particularly, as, as Bill was mentioning. Um, the royal family, the so-called you know, heritage industry, is so crucial to Britain's um, you know, tourism, to its economy, the way that it packages its history and, and um, for the world to enjoy. And so much of that is to do with the royal family and the world's interest in that, and indeed, um, of these Commonwealth countries where the queen is on the money still. And so there's all these little symbolic things that are, are going to be affected and changed um, when the time comes. Uh, Bill Booth, how has the relationship of the royal family uh, changed and evolved even in recent years with some of those Commonwealth countries? Um, I say it's probably gone down. Um, uh, a number of countries in the Caribbean are, are thinking about um, of breaking ties with having the queen as their, their head of state. Um, I think there's a lot of support and honor uh, shown for the queen when she goes visits abroad to the Commonwealth countries. But um, this is the 21st century, so a lot of uh, countries feel like that's kind of a 20th or 19th century uh, institution. Uh, and they want to go their own ways. They want to do their own thing, um, less uh, under the shadow of the, of the queen or, or beside the queen. Um, that makes sense. The Commonwealth is a great idea. It's, it's a good economic idea. But how much one wants to be tied to the monarchy uh, is, a, is a decision these countries will make. And I, I think a lot of them will, will slowly peel away under Charles. We we're watching uh, the Queen's health. Uh, the royal statement from Buckingham Palace has just said that the 
Queen's doctors are concerned for Her Majesty's health. They have recommended she remain under medical supervision. Her family, however, is traveling to Balmoral Castle uh, to be with her. Uh, James, that's really something we focused on because of the significance of so many family members traveling there, putting aside any, uh, you know, tension or uh, uh, fracturous relationships within the family to go there. One complication is that they have many different spokespeople at this point because they're not all under the umbrella anymore uh, of, of what Prince Charles is under. So there's sort of this effort to try to make sure we have information from all these different camps, James. Right. I was about to say, just like, you know, the, the royals are just like any other family, except they're not, uh, because they do uh, have these coteries of communications aides and, uh, and, and hangers on. Uh, and, and it's not just uh, you know, Harry and Meghan who have gone to California, but are, are there, of course, uh, in, in Britain right now. It's also you know, Prince Andrew, who was so implicated in the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. Uh, th these are all members of her family. These are her, uh, you know, her children and grandchildren. And for, you know, for them, she's not the the monarch or the head of state. She's their their mom and grandmother. Uh, so, you know, the, the, it's none of us have been alive for uh, a world in which uh, Elizabeth is not queen. She's the longest serving monarch uh, in Britain's history, but uh, the second longest. She's just two years short of the Sun King, uh, France. Uh, in, so th th all the members of her family uh, are, are, you know, it, this is all they've ever known. Uh, it, it really is remarkable when you think about how different the world is uh, than the one that existed when Elizabeth was born. Uh, Hannah, uh, Liz Truss, the new prime minister, has tweeted out, the whole country will be deeply concerned by the news from Buckingham Palace. Uh, how much do we know about the time they had together? You know, the, this new prime minister has just uh, come into power, Hannah. Well, um, it was already unusual, and it was an indication of the Queen's state of her health that um, that the plan had to be for Boris Johnson and Liz Truss to both go to Scotland uh, in order to to take part in this ceremony. Um, and we saw this this picture of the two of them together, um, the, just shaking hands, inviting Liz Truss to form a new government. But I really can't um, imagine what a, what, a, what a huge moment to become prime minister for on your third day um, in office. Liz Truss is already facing a very troubled time in Britain, a really extreme cost of living crisis and, and energy crisis, um, sort of sparked by the war in Ukraine. Um, a lot of British people and businesses who are, who are looking at really um, significant um, bills uh, for their energy as a result of this, and she has been busy sort of presenting her plan for how she plans to to cap those bills and how to how to deal with it. Um, but now, of course, this is going to take all, all of the government's focus. This is such a huge moment, as James laid out the plan. Um, this whole you know, ten days uh, that we're looking at. Um, but it's really uh, this brief meeting that Liz Truss had, becoming the fifteenth prime minister, that the Queen had. Um, had met with um, in in the past. She had met weekly in private audiences with each prime minister. So again, while not you know technically playing a political role, still having that very important, very regular um, and consistent role um, in British politics. With these these not many people you know have an audience with the prime minister every week, um, and so her whole focus will have to change to this. I am sure, even as there's so much else going on in Britain. Um, she tweeted earlier, Liz Truss, saying, my thoughts and the thoughts of the people across our United Kingdom are with Her Majesty the Queen and her family at this time. We're sure to hear um, more from her on this. Mm. With me now, post-royal blogger and opinions editor, Autumn Brewington. Uh, Autumn, it is so unusual to even hear any sort of statement come out about the health and wellness of the Queen. Um, give us a sense of, of that significance. Uh, it's hard to overstate how significant it is. The palace is really particular about the things that they choose to comment on. They don't comment on a lot of things. So the fact that they said they're concerned about the queen's health and also um, the fact that other members of the royal family are going to Scotland now, it's enormously significant. So talk to us about the 70th uh, uh, anniversary that just happened of the queen being on the royal throne and how significant that was in 
her tenure, her life, but also in in the lives of you know her, her subjects. So one thing that um, you know is interesting about your question, it's really we're not just seeing a moment that impacts you know sort of today's generation. She has been queen for more than seventy years. So going back so many generations, she served in World War II. You know, she understood what it was like, you know, for um, Britain during the Blitz. She's been a part of the, you know, just social fabric of not only Britain, but also the Commonwealth countries for seven decades. And so it was so significant um, that she would not only become the country's longest reigning monarch, which she did, I think, in 2015, but also now, you know, I think she's the technically the second longest reigning monarch in world history she just through the length of time that she's been on the throne, she's really shaped how people see monarchy and just, you know, what the role is. And it's, it's something that, you know, she's been so present for people. She's also really become part of the background. You know, she's on the stamps, she's on the money, she's the queen. Like you don't even really have to think about it. She's always been present. So for her to not be present, it's just, there's so many different ways in which um, she comes out of public life. So, Bill, how much concern is there for this potential transition? We will see how the Queen's health uh, fares over the next 24 hours. But for this potential uh, transition, how much concern is there within the royal family and its supporters for the sustainability of the monarchy? Uh, because, as Autumn points out, she is so singularly connected uh, to the monarchy in the minds of Britons and people around the world. Um, yes, if you if you look at public polling in in Britain, uh, the Queen has very very high numbers, and her heir uh, Prince Charles, who would be King Charles, uh, comes in much lower. Um, and so um, so the the face of the monarchy will change dramatically. Uh, we'll go from. A, a very nice older lady who's you know been on the throne forever from since before anyone was really born she's 96 years old um uh, uh, to charles who people have opinions about and some of those opinions are negative um most brits are in support of the monarchy as an institution there's a decent number of republicans who don't like the idea of, of, of a king or a queen um but i think most brits support the institution i think with charles um uh, it will go on. It, he'll be a very different king, uh, a very different monarch than, than his mother. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that goes year in and year out. I mean, Charles has had some uh, scandals in the recent, even just few years about he, he runs lots of trusts and foundations and um, he has to raise money to do that. And so he deals with some, you know, um, some iffy people. Uh, I wouldn't call them completely, you know, sketchy, but he deals with um, with all sorts of donors from all sorts of countries uh, who want uh, to be close to the monarch. Um, and so we'll we'll see how all that shakes out and what people think of him. Um, but the you know, will the monarchy survive the twenty first century? Um, that's an open question. Will it survive for the next five or ten years? For sure, I think. Rhonda Colvin, uh, it was just last year in 2021 uh, that we were all together um, to witness the funeral and the um, the ceremonies for the Queen's husband, uh, the late Prince Philip. He lived to the age of 99. Tell us about their relationship and uh, what his passing meant for the Queen. Yeah, he almost lived to be 100, and I know a lot of people were watching the Queen's health after he passed away because there was such a closeness. Their marriage uh, spanned uh, over 70 years, uh, three-fourths of a century. Uh, he was a constant in her life and someone that uh, she said was a rock for her, and it's sort of hard to kind of imagine someone who has sort of uh, the majesty of, of the Queen needing some support, but he was that for her. And in fact, he was the person who told her in 1952 when her father George died, he told her that she would be queen. He announced that to her. 
um, and he helped raise the kids as well. Uh, and, and that's something that we, we often don't focus on when we talk about the queen or the royal family is the fact that they are very human. There is a family structure there, you know, father, wife, uh, son, daughter. And we're kind of seeing that play out now as we uh, see the family gather together. And it reminds us of the humanity of the royal family. Um, but through his death and, and his sickness before the death, we learned a lot about uh, just how close they were, even though that's something that they may not have telegraphed to the rest of the world. But uh, from those who know them and their family, of course, have said that they had such a, a rich marriage and a closeness. James, let's talk about uh, Prince Philip's funeral. It was really uh, remarkable to watch Queen Elizabeth by herself uh, in the pews there at uh, St. George's Chapel in Windsor. Uh, mourning, you know, she was dressed in black and her face was veiled in a mask. She almost looked as if she was part of the pews, but it also set in motion uh, part of the, the scandal that brought down Boris Johnson because Boris Johnson was imposing all the COVID lockdown rules uh, that required the queen to mourn the loss of her beloved husband alone at the same time that he was having these parties at 10 Downing Street. And it pained a lot of Britons to see their queen so isolated, so alone. Uh, it, it really is remarkable how much the queen resonates with the common man. Uh, polling has shown that she is sort of most beloved uh, by the, the lower classes. Uh, and she was a, this, a, a speaker, uh, we see there uh, some Range Rovers heading into Balmoral. Uh, she was, uh, she was, she got COVID uh, just like so many Britons did. And uh, early in the pandemic, she was releasing these video messages. And uh, in one, she ended by recalling the World War II song, We'll Meet Again. Uh, and again, it, she was she's someone who, as a as a child, experienced the Blitz, and uh, and that was a, a wartime anthem in Britain. And so she, you know, from World War II to the pandemic, she really helped, even though she was such a neutral political figure, guide her kingdom through uh, this this pandemic. We know that the royal family has uh, rushed to Balmoral Castle to see Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Harry has gone without Meghan. Uh, we have that report. Um, Hannah, what will you be watching in terms of, uh, of the family and um, how they handle this development of the Queen's ill health? Well, of course, um, the big question, as others have been referring to, is um, that of King Charles, of Charles's popularity or lack thereof in Britain, um, in the Commonwealth, around the world. I think that, um, as people have been saying, um, the Queen's really steadfast commitment to this official political neutrality has, I think, allowed for her incredible popularity, whereas where, where um, as Bill was saying earlier, um, Charles's various scandals involving donors, involving lobbying, um, it's, it's less of a secret where his politics lie, and that sort of throws the whole idea of the constitutional monarchy into, into question. Is this merely a symbolic figure or, or a figure with real political power? And I think it's more difficult to reign as popular as the queen has if you sort of cross that line, perhaps. Um, I think that, uh, and, and, and while the, the queen is, of course, officially apolitical, she is still has this incredible political power, um, as, as uh, James was talking to. Her uh, commitment to COVID social distancing rules at her husband's funeral last year um, was so central to the outrage at Boris Johnson and the, the um, endless reports of more and more parties that had been happening in Downing Street, um, really at the same time that the Queen was was sitting alone in a pew at her at her husband's funeral. So while she is not, you know, like out there lobbying um, and taking political stance. Um, really uh, g going in opposition to the Queen and the Queen's behavior in that way is, is going to be harmful to any British politician. Will Charles have the same sort of power over British culture and politics is unclear. Um, I think we can't underestimate how, how alive the memory of Princess Diana is, how that quintessential scandal of the 90s remains in people's minds, and how beloved she was, um, even to those in Britain who might not care for the royal family, the monarchy as a whole. She was seen as this sort of anti-royal royal for so many reasons. 
um, and there may be some of that stain on Charles's um, popular um, political appearances as a result of that time. Certainly, he has been stepping into a lot of the Queen's duties recently. He has been um, trying to, you see him on, on the, you know, you see him on British TV all the time doing the royal things, um, uh, making those appearances, um, perhaps trying to build up that popularity. But um, he will have a, a few big hurdles in his way to achieve that. Rhonda, the pop culture uh, interpretation of the Queen and also you know, the last few decades, the death of Princess Diana two and a half decades ago, uh, uh, all of these series that have come out sort of delving into the history of the royal family, how much of that is influencing and coloring how we here in the United States view the royal family? Well, it seems uh, through the span of her time uh, with the crown, she has had to uh, come up against the popularity of the monarchy, and especially what the monarchy looks like outside of the UK. And I think throughout time, you have a lot of Americans who have followed all sorts of pop culture, whether it be the Netflix series The Crown, uh, whether it be you know movies that came out. There was one uh, that came out called The Queen uh, with Helen Mirren, where she uh, is seen uh, in the way she was when she heard about Diana's death. And, and a lot of people who are royal biographers, those who are journalists who cover the royal family, have said that some of those depictions are not exactly accurate. But it has shaped, uh, in, a, in some Americans' mind, what the monarchy is and who Queen Elizabeth is. Um, but a lot of journalists uh, say that, that cover the royal family do point out that she is very human. Uh, she is someone who was a grandmother to Harry and William uh, when they learned their uh, mother had died uh, 25 years ago. And in fact, they were at Balmoral uh, at that time when they told Harry and William that their mother had passed. Uh, so this estate is also very significant in the life of the royal family. But overall, Americans kind of, uh, you have maybe a, a couple different camps of Americans where you have some who are royal watchers and, and they're all into it, and you have others who uh, kind of come and go with their royal knowledge. But almost all Americans know Queen Elizabeth. She is a fixture on the global stage uh, that has been throughout most people's lives. So uh, whenever there may be some sort of announcement, there is going to be that outpouring of sympathy all over the world. This is a truly significant moment. Autumn Brewington, what was the Jubilee like uh, when the Queen and the UK celebrated her 70 years on the throne? You know, there were there was a lot of, I think, celebration tinged with a little bit of sadness, like this idea, you know, when the announcements came that the queen wouldn't be present for certain ceremonies, people sort of recognizing this might be the last big event at which she was seen. And in particular, you know, there was this amazing concert outside of Buckingham Palace, I think on the third night. And when Prince Charles spoke, um, as he had during the Diamond Jubilee 10 years earlier, he mentioned, you know, his father, Prince Philip, who wasn't there. And that was such a human moment. Ten years earlier, Prince Philip had been part of the celebrations, but he was hospitalized. And so Charles led a round of cheers for the crowd, you know, saying, you know, perhaps he can hear us in hospital a few miles away. And this year, in June, when, you know, people are celebrating the Jubilee, but also at this moment, he is clearly in more fragile health, um, here was Charles saying, you know how terribly you miss your strength and stay, which is how the queen had famously referred to her husband. Um, and clearly, she missed very much after his death. Um, William Booth uh, in London, uh, I'd like to hear more from you about how the British people are processing the news of the queen's ill health and, and how much it's dominating the conversation or, or, or not, frankly. Um, it's completely dominated the, the TV uh, airwaves, the broadcast, and, and a lot of online news. Um, the, the, the news broke kind of slowly at midday uh, with the palace announcing that she was under uh, medical supervision. Um, people are kind of just catching up to it now. The, the queen has not passed away. She is alive. She's a, a, a Balmoral. But, I mean, I think uh, Brits are reacting to it, and I think they, um, they're waiting to see what happens. Um, uh, many people who have had elderly parents know that things can come and go, uh, that they can get, grow very ill and then kind of bounce back. Um, people are just watching and waiting. Um, there's no big, huge outpourings of grieving or worry 
uh, in front of Buckman's, uh, in front of uh, Bu uh, Buckingham Palace. Um, as you see there, there's some people outside of Balmoral uh, Castle. Most of those to me look like uh, media and a few locals. Um, so uh, I think people are waiting and watching. Um, they've been kind of prepared for this for a while. I mean, to be honest, um, she's had a few health scares and then during her diamond, uh, platinum jubilee, she missed um, a handful of events. And those were events that she was scheduled to be at, like at St. Paul's uh, Cathedral. She was supposed to be there. And then at the last minute, they told us uh, that she'd overextended herself the day before uh, watching the parades and couldn't make it. So uh, people are smart and they, they know what this means. And she's in, she's in failing health. And so they're seeing what's happening next. Hannah Jewell, uh, the British media coverage will certainly be something to watch as this story develops and we track the Queen's health. What, what, is, it, what is it like? How does it differ from what uh, we might see here in the United States or around the world? Well, of course, while, um, while uh, it makes sense that news organizations all over the world will have prepared for this moment, putting a plan in action, I think it's really just going to be taken to the next level in British media and everything from the BBC to, to the tabloid press, I think it's going to be um, really wall to wall. And we saw a taste of this with um, Prince Philip's death and the coverage of that, um, in which basically all radio from news to like pop radio channels all cut out with the same, um, to go to the same announcement of his death. And we saw this really all regularly scheduled programming canceled and replaced with this royal coverage. Today we've seen the BBC suspend their regular programming. Um, we have all the big uh, networks, ITV, Sky, so on, are all covering only this, So, um, which really um, indicates the seriousness of the situation. They've also brought out their um, so their, their main anchor of the, the 10, the 10 o'clock news on the BBC, Hugh Edwards, who normally is like the sort of main primetime anchor. He has been on today all day, seen in this, you know, black suit, black tie, um, all of these indications of how seriously they are taking it. Um, really, uh, nor indeed would the royal family be gathering in this way if it, if it were, you know, a, not as serious as, as it could be. We're obviously still waiting to hear about that. And uh, meanwhile, there are a few people who are, beginning to gather outside Buckingham Palace, a few outside Windsor Palace in the rain um, to gather and await any news there. Phil Booth, let's recap what we know so far about the Queen's health at age 96. Tell us what we know. Um, we don't know very much. We know that her doctors told us at midday today uh, that they were concerned and that she's under uh, medical uh, supervision. She's at uh, Balmoral uh, Castle, her uh, Scottish uh, royal estate and holiday residence. Uh, she's not been taken to any hospital. She's still uh, at home at residence. Um, but the, the, as my colleagues have mentioned, the nature of that note was very concerning, uh, not just to the news media, foreign and domestic, but to, you know, uh, Liz Trust, the new prime minister and, and the people around the world. They were they were alerted to the fact that the, the queen probably wasn't doing very well. But that's all we know officially at this point. And we know that uh, uh, the family, uh, her children and, and, and grandchildren, are uh, heading to her side. So the, uh, Prince Charles is there, Prince Andrew, Princess Anne, and then uh, Prince William and also Prince Harry is headed there. And so um, uh, I think a lot of people are reading a lot into that, probably for good reason. James Homan, let's go to you for uh, what happens if the Queen should die, because it is a very structured plan. In fact, the British have been preparing for this. The early iterations of uh, Operation London Bridge uh, started in the 1960s. Uh, and a lot of the planning revolves around the initial first hours after the Queen would die. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily get an official announcement right away after she had died uh, so that people could be notified. Uh, we would expect to hear from Prince Charles uh, on the day that his mother passes away. Uh, he, the Privy Council uh, is poised. Uh, it is a hereditary monarchy. It's not like there's an election. Uh, would, would officially declare uh, Charles to be king the day after his mother passed away. He will. Uh, you know, we, he would address the country. And then we'd also see that the uh, both chambers of parliament would convene immediately. Uh, the 
if possible, within hours of the Queen's passage. Uh, the, in the House of Lords, the two thrones there at the heart of the chamber will be replaced by a single chair and a cushion bearing the golden outline of a crown. Uh, and there is, a, a, because there is state-run media there, uh, there are several different BBC channels. Their programming will merge into one. Hannah was talking about uh, how the coverage has already shifted. Uh, you would expect that on various radio stations, uh, the kinds of music that they're playing uh, will uh, change before the official announcement came, uh, but after word had, had spread around uh, the sort of the, the official uh, British media that the announcement was coming. Well, the Speaker of the UK Parliament made an unusual statement this morning, sending the best wishes of the Parliament to the monarch. Let's listen. I wish to say something about the announcement which has just been made about Her Majesty. I know I speak on behalf of the entire House when I say that we send our best, best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen and that she and the Royal Family are in our thoughts and prayers at this moment. I am going to take no more, just to, if there is anything else, we will update the House accordingly. Thank you. From Parliament earlier today, uh, Bill Booth, uh, they of course are watching to see what happens next. Yes, I'm sorry. Re repeat the question. Uh, Parliament is certainly watching to see what happens next. You know, in this age bill of raging social media and things sort of leaking out, there, there's a very sort of old-fashioned way that we will likely learn if the Queen passes. Oh, yeah. There'll be a formal uh, a, a announcement. Um, the, the BBC will, 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 will be informed and given a few minutes. They'll interrupt newscasts. Um, there'll be pronouncement at the palace. Um, uh, all of those things will happen. Um, uh, in uh, Parliament today, the, um, the, the Speaker, as you just noted, uh, wished the Queen well. Um, the, she will um, uh, return to uh, London. She won't stay if, if she passes on. She, her body, or her coffin will return to London, and that's when the uh, uh, other events will begin to to happen in terms of at the Abbey and Charles going on the road. We're watching closely uh, the Queen's health uh, because of the statement put out uh, by Buckingham Palace and also because the family has rushed to Balmoral Castle uh, to be at her bedside. Autumn Brewington, uh, let's talk about the Queen's uh, longevity and the choice to stay in that role. You know, one thing that you have written about and, and talked about in the past was whether or not at a certain point a Queen should abdicate, step down and pass uh, the crown on to the next generation to lead. It's something that this queen has elected not to do. Uh, why? So I think all of the factors that shaped her coming to the throne really are just indelible for her. So when she turned 21, she gave a speech um, marking you know, her coming of age and saying that her whole life, whether it be long or short, would be devoted to public service and the service of the Commonwealth family to which, you know, she said, we all belong. Um, that was really meant to show in the wake of the abdication of her uncle in 1936 that, you know, she was committed to the monarchy and to her future role. And so as she has reigned for so long, um, longer than any other British monarch in history, she has, you know, become older, her health has become more fragile. Um, the piece that I wrote that you mentioned, you know, earlier this year after she uh, didn't take part in the state opening of parliament was just sort of looking at if she's physically not up to doing the job, the question of whether it makes sense to um, move her heirs into their next roles. Her son, her oldest son, Prince Charles, is 73. His oldest son, Prince William, just turned 40. Um, they've never had, a, they've never been in a position where this many future monarchs um, have been at such an advanced age. And so her longevity has really been amazing, both for, you know, as a family, the generations that they, the time that they've been able to have together, but also like the crown has not changed hands the way that it ordinarily or more regularly had um, in history. So that's part of what makes the queen's reign, you know, such so impactful why she in particular is so associated with the royal family because people are so used to seeing her and so consistently her out over such a great amount of time 
James, let's go to you for more on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the queen is someone who has clung not to power, but to duty. And that is how she sees her job. Uh, that is how she sees her responsibility. Uh, to give you a sense of her longevity, on the day that she was coronated in June 1953, the very same day word got to London that Lord Edmund Hillary had planted the Union Jack atop Mount Everest, the first person to make it to the top of Mount Everest. And the, the, the numbers are remarkable. Uh, 14 U.S. presidents have held office during her reign, seven popes, 15 prime ministers. Uh, she has been this uh, the kind of the spinning image of stability throughout, the epitome, the embodiment of stability. And that's why, despite her age of 96 years, her death would represent instability uh, for the monarch, for Britain. Uh, she uh, has, you know, she because she's represented stability, her loss uh, w feels all the more meaningful potentially to the to the British subjects. Rhonda, I know you've been uh, tracking and thinking a lot about her relationship with so many presidents and also with the American public. Tell us more. That's right. She's met uh, almost all of the uh, modern presidents. She started with uh, Harry Truman when she was in her 20s. She went uh, to visit with him uh, on behalf of her father, King George, who was sick at the time. But that's the first U.S. president she ever met, and she's met all of them since, including Biden. The only exception is uh, LBJ. She did not get to meet him. Uh, and LBJ did say there was really no reason for that, but she was pregnant uh, at the time of Kennedy's assassination. So she wasn't doing trips at that time and then may have missed out on a, a visit with LBJ. But except for him, all of the other presidents she has met. And when you read what they say about her after they've had meetings with her, they, they seem stunned. Uh, they, they feel that they have been in the presence of greatness. And uh, whether it's uh, Barack Obama when he met her or George Bush has also talked extensively about his time meeting with her. Uh, there's a sense with her, because she is a monarch, she um, is apolitical, of course, but she also does not have to go along with uh, the politics of the day because she's going to be queen uh, regardless. So that's something that uh, has impressed upon some of our elected officials is that she can remain uh, a constant and, and deliver this sense of duty uh, that's really untouchable because there's no uh, risk of her being voted out. So what you're seeing with her is often what you're, you're getting uh, is that she has this sense of duty. Uh, she, uh, some royal watchers and those journalists who have covered her for years say she loves her job. That is what has with, uh, made her withstand all of these years that she actually loves being uh, the sovereign, uh, loves being the crown. And that is something that she has also tried to teach uh, her family. And you kind of have, you saw that a little bit uh, in the last few years when Harry and Meghan wanted to step back from their royal duties uh, and not have those time Titles, uh, that was something that kind of took a, a little time for uh, the royal family and, and all the title assignments to be worked out because that's something that had not been done really before. Um, there is some precedent, but not exactly how they did it. But there is always a sense of duty from her, and that's something that uh, it appears that she's wanted to pass down to her family. William Booth, uh, after the uh, comparatively long time for David Cameron to serve as prime minister for about six years, we've had a succession of prime ministers who have not been in office very long. So tell us about this incredible contrast between a queen who is just there for the long haul and these PMs who are sort of coming and going, um, even ones who have lasted a decade are always outlasted by the queen. Yes. I mean, even the most long-termed um, uh, prime ministers in Britain um, are always bested by the queen. But, I mean, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, in, in recent succession, we had David Cameron for a while, and then pop, pop, pop. Uh, we had Theresa May, then Boris Johnson, and now Liz Truss. We've had three prime ministers in a few years. Um, all in the Conservative Party. Um, the Conservative Party's been kind of, its hair has been on fire and has been going a little nuts, and they keep getting rid of their prime ministers for one reason or another, which we can talk about some other day. But I mean, it, compared to the, <laughs> the Queen, the prime minister is there for their 15 minutes of fa fa fame and then, and then off. Um, 
Uh, same with the governments, uh, ministers appointed and then ministers go. Um, everyone seems sort of a short uh, timer uh, in the government these last you know, five or six years um, against the queen. Um, you know, the queen uh, carries on. She's no, uh, no, nothing, nothing undermining that at all. Um, but, the, um, but the government has been in some disarray and have a bunch of different leaders. Liz Truss just, meted her, uh, just met her on Tuesday. Um, and, um, you know, we'll see how many more times Liz Truss uh, meets the queen. Um, if the queen survives and keeps going on, you know, but she's in frail health. She might not be taking her weekly Wednesday afternoon meeting with the prime minister, with uh, Liz Truss, um, which is something that Boris got to enjoy for his uh, three years and something that uh, Theresa May enjoyed for her three years. So um, the weekly sessions in Buckingham uh, or during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, by telephone. James, what has the relationship been like between the Queen and the various prime ministers? It really has depended on who the prime minister was. And some of it has depended on the the, the power dynamic. Uh, you know, when Winston Churchill was prime minister, she was a, a young woman new to the job. Uh, it, you know, he was very deferential uh, and respectful, but uh, he was in many ways the elder partner. Uh, in in more recent years, sometimes, you know, the, the Queen has these private sessions with the prime minister, and they really have stayed remarkably private. The council uh, doesn't leak out. For some prime ministers, it's been more like a therapy session. Uh, for others, it's uh, been more kind of a, of a box checking exercise. Margaret Thatcher uh, had, a, had a kind of an icy relationship with the queen. They never really quite clicked. Their sessions were quite icy. Uh, Liz Truss, the new prime minister, has said repeatedly uh, and really modeled herself after uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, the Iron Lady. Uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, Liz Truss, when she was in college at Oxford, was uh, anti-monarchist uh, and said that, that there shouldn't be a monarch. She has uh, since recanted that position and said that was a youthful indiscretion. Uh, so, it, 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 you know, each person really develops their own relationship and their own vibe. Uh, with the Queen during these one-on-one -on -one sessions in which no one else is in the room. Mm. Hannah, let's talk about the Queen's popularity among different generations of Britons and, uh, and the relationship they may have with the royal family and with Queen Elizabeth herself. Well, it's funny to sort of see, take Liz Truss as an example of this in the so-called youthful indestructions of being a uh, Republican in the British sense, an anti-monarchist. Certainly, this is something that we see in Britain today, is that younger people, millennials and younger, are more likely to want a republic to abolish the monarchy, whereas baby boomers above are more likely to want to retain it. Um, and you can kind of understand that divide in the sense of, of, of baby boomers and older having lived their entire lives with the queen, having a, a much deeper relationship um, for that reason with them. But also for you know a younger, more diverse Britain, uh, the monarchy is in, um, inseparable from the history of the British Empire and how feelings about the British Empire, its value or its, or its not, um, vary a lot uh, among different age groups in Britain. Um, and also younger people who are facing inequality in Britain, you know, the British, the royal family, its main source of income is collecting rents on hereditary estates. And um, young people in Britain are renters and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. Of course, um, we see in polling that there's a lot of different feelings across generations about different members of the royal family, with the queen being, as we've talked about a bit, so much more popular um, than Prince Charles. And um, so this is going to be a challenge for Charles, a challenge for the royal family and its longevity going forward. Justin Trudeau of Canada is tweeting out, Hannah, that uh, his thoughts and the thoughts of Canadians across the country are with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II at this time. We're wishing her well and sending our best to the royal family. So, Hannah, tell us more about the relationship with, with places like Canada and the leaders there. Well, the uh, relationship um, of the Queen, the royal family, Britain to its Commonwealth nations like Canada, uh, it really depends where you are looking. You have places like um, Canada where she is the, uh, the Queen is the head of state. 
um, where there are um, those warm feelings. You'll see heads of states, Justin Trudeau and so on, will be continuing to make these kinds of statements, whereas you see elsewhere in the Commonwealth, particularly in the Caribbean, you see um, you see those uh, political leaders who are and, and popular movements trying to sever ties with the royal family, fundamentally because of its, its relationship to um, the British Empire, that history, and the history of slavery in these countries, too, and, and why Britain ended up in these places. So it's a lot more of a sort of tense relationship in those such places, certainly not um, across the board. Certainly the Queen is very popular among many people in all of these places. Um, but you see how those different histories versus a place like Canada, where you have a sort of settler colonial um, situation, um, having a really different historical emotional attachment to the Queen than you might elsewhere in the world um, and in the former British Empire. Hannah, what stands out to you about the Queen's legacy and her life? Um, well, it sounds it sounds like the simplest thing you could say, but just the the longevity of it, just the um, 1952 to now 1953 was her coronation, but she became queen in 1952, um, is just a shocking amount of time, really. Um, this hitting the 70 year mark this year with celebrations, I think that. Um, uh, trying to grapple with how much the world has changed, how much um, technology has changed, how much politics have changed, how much the role of Britain in the world has changed in that time with this one constant of the Queen being there always, um, thinking of uh, the uh, just uh, how much you know longer than some of our lifetimes she has been there um, on the throne, I think is, is going to be the biggest sort of psychic shock to Britain, to British people, to those that love the Queen because of... Um, uh, that sense of change and and sort of you know the innate the the inevitable fear and feelings that that come with that um, among any human being such a huge uh, sense of change in the cultural sphere. And Rhonda, when you look back at the Queen's legacy and her 96 years so far, what stands out to you in terms of uh, some of the big moments of her life? I mean, all of it. If you just as Hannah was discussing the longevity, how she has been this constant presence on the global stage. I mean, it's just mind blowing to really think about all of the world leaders that she has met and sat down with. Uh, whether they, some of them may have been elected officials from other countries, some of them, even in her history, she's met dictators and, and people she has said may not have been the, the folks she wanted to meet with. But she has seen so much. And there are very few people uh, who would have that type of experience, of course. Uh, of course, most people won't have the experience of being in a monarchy, but just being able to see what she saw, World War II, uh, just all the things that, has, that have happened in her own country, but also elsewhere in the globe. It's just when you take a step back and, and think about all that she has seen uh, and all that she knows and all the conversations she's had, uh, she will certainly be missed on, on the world stage. Autumn Brewington, let's just review what we know so far about the Queen's health because we are all watching and waiting for more news. So anyone who is just joining us, uh, what do we know so far? Uh, we know that the Queen, who has been in fragile health um, really the past several months, um, is being, she is comfortable at Balmoral Castle. Her doctors have said they are concerned for her health. Uh, members of the royal family have gone to Balmoral Castle. I think there were just recently pictures showing it looked like Prince William was driving a Range Rover with uh, the Queen's sons, Prince Andrew and Prince Edward, and Edward's wife, Sophie, were also in the car with him. Um, so people are gathering with her at Balmoral Castle. And Autumn, as we've been talking about the Queen's legacy, um, you, you had done so much thinking about her time uh, on the throne as her jubilee hit this past year, uh, celebrating 70 years of rule. Um, what stands out to you in her biography? I think part of what's remarkable about her in 2022 is how committed she has been to putting the monarchy before the monarch for so many years. She has reigned longer than any of um, Britain's previous kings or queens, but she has really been committed to putting duty first and the role first. And so you could see there were times when, you know, she sacrificed family time or, you know, perhaps when she's in these, you know, long um, royal overseas visits, you know, having these very long days. And these are, you know, when they do what they call royal tours, those are, those are big operations. Um, you know, just the, the consistency day in, day out, all of the 
hospital openings, like the plaque unveilings, all of these things, big and small, that she has just shown up for for 70 years. I think when you asked earlier, you know, what was the sense of the Jubilee? Really, um, I think there were a lot of people in Britain who were just so proud of the way that she has been, you know, committed to her role. And really, she has put the country before herself. And that kind of selflessness in just in terms of saying she's never canceled on something because you know she's tired or she just didn't feel like showing up for the thing or she just wanted to put her feet up how she has continued to work up until age 96 you know we saw her this week you know she performed her constitutional duty of inviting a new prime minister to form a government she was also photographed you know holding the walking stick that had been her husband's because you know she's not able to um, walk without some sort of aid now um, I think really her consistency in just putting the role first is, is such a huge part of her legacy. Bill Booth, is that something that is felt and perceived by uh, younger Britons, this, this idea of linking the queen to duty? And do they have the same perception perhaps of Charles, but even the next generation down? Um, I think the queen for all Brits, old and young, is kind of in a class of her own. Um, um, you know, it's in, it's always fascinating to me. I mean, the Queen, I don't think, has ever given an interview, press interview in her life. Um, she makes comments and things and gives brief speeches, but the, the Queen has never sat down with the BBC and discussed anything, uh, certainly nothing personal. And so all these glimpses we have of her, I think they're fascinating, but they're just kind of partial. Um, we are not in the palace. We do not hear these conversations. We have TV shows and movies that show us what we think it looked like, but a lot of people who were even there say, well, don't, don't be completely fooled. It wasn't exactly like this. Um, but to your question, I think that the, um, uh, that the queen is as seen as, as you're, you were saying, as a universal a symbol of like of doing duty and, and showing up. If you are somebody who volunteers and feeds um, homeless people in Britain or volunteers for your church, um, you know, your model in some ways is the queen. The queen is a model of sort of duty. She always shows up. She always shakes somebody's hand. She takes the time. Um, she doesn't uh, blow these things off. She, she's there. Um, she's seen as a mother figure, grandmother figure, very distant uh, kind of a royal person to, I think, young people uh, who kind of get her, but probably assume that it's their grandfather, grandmother's generation. Um, the younger generation, Harry and Meghan and Prince William are more seen as sort of uh, modern people, but then again, like more tabloid fodder um, with their own foibles and their own problems in their, you know, relationships or, or with the media or whatever. I mean, the, you know, the queen is not seen, the, the tabloid, do, the British tabloids do not make fun of the queen. Uh, but they'll have they make hay with uh, with, with uh, Harry and Meghan and William and the others. Bill, what do you, what is on your mind as you think about the Queen's personal biography? Uh, as you as you reflect on on her life here, as we watch to see how serious this illness is. I mean, it, it's it, it's it's what we've been saying. The Queen's biography, the Queen's span is just so vast. I mean. You know, the Queen uh, predates uh, really almost the atom bomb. Um, uh, she, she predates the Beatles, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Um, the Queen, when the Queen was around at the very beginning, you know, um, there were barely telephones. Uh, there were teletype machines. There wasn't any computers. Um, uh, television was new. Well, when the Queen uh, came up through, I mean, they they um, uh, they they filmed things on film and then put them in um, theaters to look at as news. There was no web, and um, it's just that remarkable longevity and that consistency um, and that service to Britain that that I think Brits hold remarkable. Um, she kind of kept it together. Um, you know, Britain went through a lot of like a bad, not great times. I'm not even talking about the Blitz during uh, during World War II, but I mean, Britain had some tough years uh, with food lines and people on the dole and all sorts of of economic strife. And you know, the Queen was sort of always there and on the money, um, and 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 the person that you saw give the Christmas Day announcement. She was solid. She was there. She was like the eternal kind of mother or grandmother um, uh, who was who was seemed to be 
pretty nice, but you didn't want to mess with her. Well, let's look back at some of that early history that uh, Bill was talking about, just how much times have changed. The Queen was traveling abroad when she received news of her own father's death. This is back in 1952, of course, that was King George VI. Let's take a look at those events as she returned to the United Kingdom in those moments. One reign has ended, a reign begins. At London Airport, waiting to meet Queen Elizabeth II, are the Duke of Gloucester and Lord Mountbatten. The Prime Minister is there and the leader of the opposition. With members of Her Majesty's government, all await the Queen's arrival. Her tour cut short by the tragic passing of her father, Queen Elizabeth leaves the Argonaut. There is no ceremony, but all thoughts for her at this sorrowful homecoming. She knows she has the true sympathy and loyal support of her ministers and her people. Of course, Queen Elizabeth there in that footage with her husband, uh, Prince Philip. Bill Booth, just looking at that footage is so remarkable in terms of everything from its tone to the clothing to just the world she was living in. And then, if you layer on top of that, how her life was dramatically changing in that moment. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's the queen, I think, for a lot of people is a time capsule. Right. So so anyone looking at those images today, it looks like some, you know, it looks like Casablanca. It looks like some some movie from a previous time. Right. The fellas with top hats and, and the, the, the jerky motions and the airplanes with propellers. Um, uh, the queen is 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 that she is this time <laughs> capsule for us. Um, I, I think it's it's something that I think is is part of her part of her power and her charm. Uh, this this fact and and also I mean just to be honest I mean you know Brits love nostalgia and they always harken back to better days uh, whether those better days are the time of empire uh, when they ruled uh, all the seven seas or um, the, the the time of of World War II when they all came to, together and they they beat the the Nazi uh, war machine um, and they and they survived the Blitz when London was bombed. And Buckingham Palace was bombed by German Luftwaffe. So um, uh, she symbolizes uh, better or great day, better days, great days in the past. Um, and um, I don't know, maybe it promises better days in the future. But there's a there's a big whiff of nostalgia around the Queen and the monarch. Um, uh, that when she passes on and Charles takes over, uh, there'll be still some of that because Charles, don't forget, is 73 years old. So he's no, you know, he's, he's a little younger than Paul McCartney, but he's an oldster. Um, and, um, um, but the generation coming up behind him, William, and, and, and uh, they're, they're more modern and they'll, they'll, they'll have to form a completely kind of different monarchy. Uh, 2.0, 3.0, something monarchy, because what worked for the Queen ain't going to work for William, um, and it might not really work for Charles. Getting close to 6 p.m. in London, uh, where we're speaking with Bill Booth and seeing live images of Buck Buckingham Palace. Uh, James Homan and I are here in our Washington Post studios, where it's almost 1 o'clock Eastern time. James, that footage uh, that we just watched a few moments ago of uh, the brand new queen returning home to the United Kingdom upon learning the news of her father's passing it, it is so remarkable because so much has changed since then. She was 25, Libby, when that happened. And when she was born 96 years ago in 1926, no one expected her to become queen. Uh, she, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was born at a townhouse in London. Uh, she expected uh, as a child that her uncle, Edward VIII, uh, would be king, uh, but he fell for a divorcee from Baltimore, Wallace Simpson, and, uh, and then her father became king. But she expected that her father would live much longer than he did. He died of cancer at 56, unexpectedly. And, uh, and it, it 
really is remarkable. You compare Elizabeth to her sister, Margaret, uh, so different temperamentally, personality-wise. Uh, before all the scandals that have followed uh, Queen Elizabeth's children, uh, Princess Margaret uh, was the, the one who drew the scandals, divorced uh, constantly in the tabloids, uh, someone who did not feel that same sense of duty that the queen uh, has felt, but very much wanted to be treated uh, as royalty. She passed away uh, a few years ago now. Uh, but Queen Elizabeth is, you know, you think about it, she was 25, now she's 96. All that time she has every day been in this job that is so unlike any other, where uh, she is, is expected to, to in, a, in a lot of ways, lead, but to do so quietly. James, update us on the latest of what we know of uh, the health of the queen, because there's a lot of reading between the lines yeah. that's happening right now. Yes, and, and we know from the pre-planning that goes on that uh, the, 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 the British government is not going to necessarily announce the, the moment that the queen has died, that she's passed away. Uh, there is quite a lot of procedure and people that need to be notified. Uh, you know, she oversees uh, more than 50 nations. She's a monarch uh, of, a, of 14 different realms. Uh, they all are going to be notified, the various cabinet ministers and prime ministers. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not like there's someone waiting at her bedside uh, to, to tweet out the second that she passed away. And so we, you know, we, we know that it's highly unusual uh, for a statement like the one we saw uh, to come from Balmoral. We know that uh, she has been in ill health. Uh, she has not returned from Balmoral as she had been expected to. And the fact that her children are there, I mean, you saw uh, a few minutes ago a video uh, there of, of the Range Rover speeding uh, really quite fast through those gates there at Balmoral. And we know that uh, Prince William was uh, driving his father. Uh, there you go, that we see an image there. Uh, you know, the, the prince himself uh, zipping in uh, with his uncles uh, into to, to see the queen. Uh, you clearly in that image yeah. see a, uh, let's talk through here a, a sense of urgency. So there's Prince William, as you said, driving. Next to him is uh, Prince Andrew, his uncle. Of course, Prince Andrew in recent years has been in the headlines for his association with uh, billionaire Jeffrey Epstein, accused sex offender and child abuser. Uh, in the back seat, we see uh, William's uncle and aunt, Prince Edward and his wife Sophie, the Countess of Wessex. Yeah, yeah, and that's, the, I mean, this is, the, the Queen has, I think, in later years uh, been introspective about uh, being a, a distant mother, uh, being very stern, uh, but this is her family, uh, and their lives for their entire lives have revolved around her, and uh, she has very much set the tone for all of them. She has been their rock uh, and the kingdom's rock, and, uh, and now you see in looking in those faces the very grim, very real possibility that uh, the, that monarch that has been such a staple of stability for 70 years uh, may not be there much longer. Hannah, let's talk more about uh, some of the complications here in really in that car, right? In, in the people who we saw rushing to be by the Queen's bedside and her immediate family. Um, Andrew uh, has had to have been distanced by the Queen herself. Let's talk about that complication. Yeah, Prince Andrew, who is the Queen's third child, second son, someone with whom she had a close relationship has not actually been seen in public with the Queen in some time, um, and that's because of um, the the fact that the scandals that have, have plagued him, um, foremost among them, the fact that he was accused of child sexual abuse by a woman um, who said that she was trafficked to him by Jeffrey Epstein. Um, in November 2019, he actually gave this really remarkable sort of car crash interview on the BBC's Newsnight program in which he um, talked about that friendship with Epstein but denied the allegations um, against him, but as a result of uh, the, the royal family's inability to sort of contain this scandal, of course, um, as he's also faced suit in America um, over these allegations, um, 
Andrew had to formally resign from his uh, public roles in, in May 2020, um, as well as give up his honorary military titles and his um, patronages of royal charities. And so this has been sort of yet another thing that the Queen has had to um, manage and to deal with in recent years with um, this son who she was quite close with, but who had become very sort of toxic for obvious reasons with allegations like those against him. So now we see him, of course, rushing to the Queen's side in that car um, and the whole family coming together um, for this moment. Autumn, uh, you know, how much do the realities of the Queen's family uh, complicate sort of the black and white or, or two-dimensional uh, image that the palace tries to put out sometimes of, of what a queen looks like, what a monarchy looks like, and what the line of succession should be? So I think the palace overall has been very grateful that, you know, these sorts of scandals are not things that the queen herself has been involved in. Um, there, there has been that dichotomy, you know, as the Post has reported, um, particularly in the past couple of years, there were questions about Andrew's relationship with Jeffrey Epstein for several years, and those just sort of um, more recently kind of gained momentum. And then finally, there were legal cases filed um, after he resigned, which was really, you know, the Queen recognized after his disastrous interview, he could not be allowed to hold, um, you know, a public position like he was in any longer. Um, there have been constant reports for really about the past two years of, you know, Andrew and his daughters really wanting him to have his royal role back and Prince Charles and Prince William being very adamantly against um, putting Andrew forward as like a face of an official face of the royal family. So that's um, just one of the ways in which we see that sort of tricky balance of they are in public positions, but these are also real people. They have, you know, family matters the way other people have family matters. Theirs just happen to play out on a global stage. Hmm. Um, Bill Booth, let's go to you on the royal family and how they are gearing up for this moment. And, you know, we're watching to see the Queen's health, the alarming uh, news that we got was just even the fact that there was a statement coming out from Buckingham Palace and the fact that the family was rushing to be by her bedside. That's why we're on the air uh, right now. But each royal family member, Bill, has to prepare for her eventual death uh, in, in their own way, not just emotionally as, as a loved one, but as someone with a public role, Bill. Um, yes. I mean, um, uh the House of Windsor is they they the, the, they call it the firm, um, uh, in, by insiders inside the the the, the palace. Uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle call it the firm in their in their remarks. I mean, you know, the firm abides, and so um, if if the Queen dies, then then um, uh, the new patriarch will be uh, Prince Charles, currently kind of the patriarch, but Prince Philip died, so uh, Prince Charles becomes. Uh, king, uh, but then also Prince William uh, steps up one, and he's the the heir to the throne. Um, so then, when people start worrying about you know Prince Charles's health or some heart condition, or he has a little stent put in or something, you know, um, all eyes will be on William. I mean, that's the way succession, um, and you don't never mess with succession. Works for a monarchy. Um, they're not voted upon. Uh, they're not picked by the people. They're hereditary, and they follow a certain line. So um, um, I wouldn't say that they're all scrambling around in any sort of bad way right now. They're probably uh, worried and upset and probably concerned about themselves and their children and, and how everyone will take the news. I, I mean, I think there will be sincerity in that front. And also, you know, this has been such a, a long-lived queen, and this has been such a process that— um, you know, there's there will be no surprises. Um, the the one thing that might be interesting is, you know, um, uh, if the queen is not well, uh, but but lingers on, um, what happens? And 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 one thing the queen has been has said uh, reportedly to a close confidant, uh, Margaret Rhodes, is that she will not abdicate meaning she will not step aside and let Charles uh, take the throne or, uh, uh, unless she has like severe Alzheimer's dementia uh, or she has a stroke, like she's incapable 
of carrying out her duties. Uh, we, we don't know what the coming days and hours will, will show us, um, but that's sort of something interesting to keep in your cap, um, that, um, that she plans on, on being queen until she really physically cannot be queen. Thanks, Bill. You know, Hannah, as we talk about who has been rushing to Balmoral and who's not going, uh, we know Harry has gone. Uh, Meghan Markle has not. Uh, she is certainly someone of great interest to people here in the United States, uh, popular here in the United States. But let's talk about the significance of her perhaps not going to Balmoral Castle. This is certainly something that um, the tabloid press in, in Britain is going to pick up on and, and, and create a narrative around um, and and build a story around because um, because uh, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, is so uniquely sort of loathed by the British tabloid press. Um, Harry and Meghan happened to be in Britain already for a charity event that was supposed to happen this evening. Um, there have been all sorts of um, reports about tensions among the royal family that is often hard to sort of see inside and, and to get the truth of. But in any case, it's, it's very clear that um, this decision for Harry to go uh, and not Meghan will be at least interpreted as being a sign of, of sort of trying to keep maybe that drama away um, from the royal family, from the queen in that moment. She will um, not be attending this charity event she was supposed to go to tonight, um, whereas Harry will. Um, and uh, we, of course, saw that uh, huge interview that the, the couple gave um, with Oprah um, just last year uh, that really showed the, um, in which they spoke very frankly and unusually frankly about their, their um, uh, discomfort and their anger and their, their disagreements with the royal family. Um, you never see something like that really in British press. That was something that only Oprah, I think, could, could get out of them and to reveal this sort of unusually close look at um, their side of the story. Um, but really, no one can know the, the, the true machinations of what's going on in a decision like that in real time. Uh, but it has certainly been noted. Um, at first, it was thought that they would both be going. But, but now um, we are reporting that only Harry is making that trip. Rhonda, tell us more about the difference in these generations. And, you know, people here in the United States have strong perceptions and very different perceptions of the queen uh, versus her son, Prince Charles, and sort of his life and legacy. And then yet another view on William and Harry. Talk to us about that, Rhonda. You know, when you look at the timeline of the modern monarchy, you see, you know, that sense of duty that we've been talking about all afternoon uh, that uh, Queen Elizabeth has exhibited, where she has stayed in place, she knows her role, she's going to do it, and she loves to do it. But during other times in histories, you see history, you see a little bit of thawing there or a little bit of tension. Think back to uh, the divorces uh, with two of her children, actually, um, uh, and notably uh, Princess Diana and uh, Prince Charles. Uh, that was something that felt like a scandal back then. You know, divorce was not something that the monarchy certainly, uh, they did not embrace it. Um, but then you, you know, move down to today's time and you see a little bit of social change there as well with uh, Harry and Meghan deciding uh, to uh, not be a part of their royal duties and to get those titles changed and raise their children outside of uh, the UK. That uh, is something that may not have happened when you uh, consider what life was like when Queen Elizabeth I took the throne. So you, you can kind of see that the monarchy, although it is an institution that kind of can withstand anything, there are also social changes that may affect uh, the choices of the royal family, the choices they have when it comes to how they want to raise their children, if they want their children to have uh, royal titles and to be associated with the daily work of royals, like, you know, travel to the, the commonwealth and, and other parts of the realm. So, you know, it, it's that's also so interesting to think about right now as we consider her entire life, is that the monarchy itself has sort of changed, even though it's withstood a lot, it's also changed in the way that those who are inside have approached their role in it. Rhonda Colvin talking just there. It's after 1 o'clock uh, Eastern time here in the United States, just after 6 o'clock in London, where we're looking at live images of Buckingham Palace. Queen Elizabeth is up at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Uh, we are reporting this news that uh, her doctors have concern for her health and the royal family has rushed up to Balmoral to be by her bedside, uh, including Prince Harry, someone we were just talking about a few moments ago, who lives here at stateside but uh, happened to be 
in the UK for a charity event. Um, we're tracking the Queen's health. It is very unusual to have doctors express any concern for her health and, of course, for the family to rush to be by her bedside, which has uh, really focused attention on her legacy, her life, and what is to come for her health. James, if the worst should happen and Queen Elizabeth II dies, there is a very organized and formalized protocol in place. It is quite remarkable. Can you take us through it? Absolutely, Libby. It is called Operation London Bridge. And this is one of the most planned, orchestrated successions in human history. Uh, literally, the Brits have been preparing for this since the early 1960s. And they've planned it down to the minute. There's a lot we know and there's a, a lot we don't know, Libby. Uh, on the day after the queen dies, D plus one, with the death day being literally in all the planning for Operation London Bridge called D-Day, uh, Charles will go from being prince to being king. The Privy Council will meet uh, for what is called a, an accession council. Uh, it's a hereditary monarchy, so there's not a lot of drama uh, about what will happen there. Uh, and then uh, Camilla will be named queen consort, uh, not the, the first wife, uh, that was Princess Diana, uh, but no doubt that uh, Camilla will take on this role of queen. Uh, and then a, a lot of other things are going to play out in pretty rapid succession whenever this day comes. Uh, soldiers will walk the processional routes in London. Prayers will be rehearsed on D plus one. Westminster Hall will be locked, cleaned. Its, its stone floor will be covered with 1,500 meters of carpet. Candles with their wicks already burnt, uh, burnt in will be brought from the abbey. The streets around uh, will be converted into ceremonial spaces. London will immediately transform. Uh, the, the Queen's 10 pallbearers are unknown. That's one of the uh, most significant ceremonial roles that will be uh, handed out. Uh, we're, we don't know who the 10 pallbearers will be. Uh, we know they've been selected. Uh, the British royals are actually buried in lead-lined coffins, uh, Libby. So when Princess Diana died, uh, her coffin weighed a quarter of a ton. Uh, that, that's really heavy. Uh, then, uh, you know, the, on D plus two, uh, the queen's body would be carried from Balmoral, where she is now, to London. There are two different plans uh, that one calls for carrying the queen's body uh, via a royal train. There would be a procession. Another plan calls for transporting her body uh, via plane. And then on D3, D plus three, the, the third day after the queen dies, uh, Charles would embark on a, a royal tour around the kingdom. Uh, and uh, that would take him uh, to, to not all over the Commonwealth, but all over the, the United Kingdom. Uh, and meanwhile, on D plus four, uh, the coffin of the queen would go to Westminster Hall as Charles goes to Northern Ireland. On the fifth day after the queen's death, there will be a procession from Buckingham Palace to the Palace of Westminster, a service at Westminster Hall, uh, then on the, the, you know, during this whole period, the queen will be lying in state for four full days at Westminster Hall. Again, the, the, we expect London to come to a standstill and uh, there will be rehearsals, various processions. Uh, meanwhile, Charles will continue on this trip around the kingdom. Uh, on the seventh day after the queen's death, Charles is expected in Wales. He'll attend a service for his mother in Cardiff. Uh, part of the consideration is that while London is expected to absorb quite a lot of people, it can't absorb everyone. Uh, and so part of the, the idea of the Charles tour is to give all of Her Majesty's subjects opportunities uh, to, to mourn. And then the 10th day after her death uh, will be the main event 
the state funeral at Westminster Abbey, two minutes of silence across the nation at noon, uh, a national holiday, and then a committal burial service at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. A remarkable timeline and progression, something that has been worked on for so long, James. But, but something that's so essential is the moment the queen passes, Charles does become king, regardless of all the pomp and circumstance. Exactly. And so he will, he will be declared there will be pomp and circumstance uh, the day after, but he immediately becomes king. There, there is continuity in government. And, of course, Liz Truss will continue on as prime minister uh, here, uh, if if the Queen passes away during her first week uh, on uh, in the job at 10 Downing Street, uh, Hannah Jewell, uh, you know, how significant is a passage like that? That incredible list of many days. Uh, how significant is that in the lives of Britons in terms of life coming to a standstill? I think that's exactly the only way to describe it, Libby, as being a, a full standstill in terms of media in, in terms of things shutting down, closing. I think you, again, you, you saw a little taste of this um, in the media, at least, when Prince Philip died last year. But um, I think we can expect uh, British people to be facing a lot of sort of various cancellations, things planned, things not going ahead as usual, because it's such a momentous, momentous moment and will be for 10 days. I think it'll be very inescapable. Um, commemorations, um, the public grieving, the, the pomp and circumstance, as you say, um, in a way that I, I can't really think of a parallel here um, of, uh, in the U.S. Of, of something that would create such, a, such an extended period of, of public mourning and of um, ceremony and such pre-planned at, at every level from the royal family, obviously, um, the media, public life. I'm sure that it's going to touch really every aspect of British life for that extended period of time. You know, James, one thing that's so remarkable is if you think about, you know, God forbid, the death of a president here in the United States or something that would really stop the function of go functioning of government. I mean, there would be the public mourning and the sadness, but, but also the reality of regrouping. This is so different because it has been anticipated for so long and planned for for so long. It's like the combination of an elder statesman and leader and yet someone who is still part of active public life. Absolutely. This is the, the, the you know, the, the, she's literally on the money. That can't be said enough. Uh, we've never had a living president on our currency uh, in the United States. And there are, to be sure, a lot of really detailed plans for when former U.S. presidents pass away. Uh, and uh, I would presume that, that plans do exist for what happens when a, a current commander in chief, which has happened a handful of times in U.S. history. And in those situations, uh, when a, a vice president needs to become president, there is obviously a line of succession that, uh, it, that is automatic, uh, but it, it's, it is different fundamentally than this. This is a hereditary monarchy. And as we were discussing- right, you know, like the prime minister, exactly. right? The leader of the government. Yeah, right? this is, I mean, this is someone who, when she was born, she was born in a townhouse. It wasn't actually clear that she was even going to be called a princess because it was not directly in, in the line of, of succession uh, or she was considered so far removed when she was born. Uh, you know, at, 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 it was a townhouse in London in Mayfair on her mother's side, not even her father's side. Uh, and the, the, the palace had to say she's still a princess. Uh, and so you know, when you think about the, basically the line of succession when she was born, she was very far down. Uh, and, and then uh, now, you know, every time there's something that happens, like, uh, you know, Prince William and Kate Middleton, uh, the princess, uh, every time they have a, another child, their child takes uh, the order above Harry in the line of succession. That's just the way it, it has worked. Uh, for nearly a thousand years, certainly more than 400 years, and uh, and you know all of a sudden Harry has fallen farther and farther in the line of succession before he basically gave up his place in the line of succession to move with his wife uh, Meghan Markle to California. With me now, Post reporter Jennifer Hassan in London. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's talk about this moment and and how focused 
the UK is on the Queen's Health right now this evening. Hi, Libby. Yes, yeah, so the UK, you know, we are always gripped whenever there's any sort of sniff of an issue with the Queen's Health. Um, we're a nation that is constantly glued to reports on how she's doing. And of course, she's 96 now. And um, we have we've known for some time, you know, she's even said it herself that that, sh that she won't live forever. And even though, as you just mentioned, we knew this moment was coming. Um, I still think there's this this really somber note across the nation where people are starting to realise, wow, you know, she she won't be around forever and actually um, this could well be the end of, of her um, outstanding reign. Jen, give us a sense of the Queen's legacy and, and how people think about her time. Do they think about her in terms of the last couple of years in a very modern context, or is it always an association of that longevity and of even the early years of her reign? Yeah, Libby, I think it really depends on who you ask. You know, the Queen's been on the throne now for, for more than 70 years. So you could ask an old lady or an, or a neighbour, what do you think of the Queen? And they would tell you something completely different um, as to, you know, if you asked a Brit who was, say, 10 years old or, or, or a teenager, um, she has been a constant in British society for so long. I think whether you're a fan of the monarchy or you're not, or whether you're obsessed with the royal family, um, regardless of your position, it's 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 like the it's the queen, you know. It's it's you know she she has just remained constant through all the tragedies and the 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 many crises that that Britain has gone through. She's just always always been there. Tell us about the queen as a cultural figure and how people view her. Uh, just you know, as Queen Elizabeth. So she's she's still really popular here. Um, she has, um, you know, throughout the years dipped and, and risen again in popularity um, around the time of Princess Diana's death. Of course, she was um, criticised for not, not coming out and making a huge statement or coming back um, to Buckingham Palace. And a lot of people criticised her handling um, of that at the time. But then she dealt with that and she rose up again. And you, you ask your average person on the street and they have a huge amount of respect for her you know there was a case here in 2017 um, where a huge apartment building caught fire uh, Grenfell Tower and about 70 people died um, in their homes during that blaze and the Queen um, who was in her 90s at the time she went down to the site and she met with um, people that lived there and had lost loved ones and she met with volunteers who were sifting through the you know, the belongings and um, volunteering and feeding the, the first responders. And, and she went down there and she met with these people and she got there before the prime minister at the time, Theresa May did. And many people really did pounce on that. And they were saying, oh, my goodness, the queen, the queen is here with her walking stick and um, her security. And, and where is the prime minister? And that's just one of so many examples where people really look to the queen in times of tragedy to sort of, navigate and comfort people when when they are grieving or going through a really difficult time. Mm. Uh, Bill Booth, how close or far away does Balmoral Castle feel? Um, obviously, just such a, you know, perennial destination for the Queen and the family, but does it feel removed from where you are? I'm trying to get a sense of if it feels um, like the Queen is still close by to people at the heart of London. Um, Balmoral Castle is way away. It's, it's, it would be a very long drive. It's 500 something, uh, miles up there. Um, and, um, uh, I think for people in England or London, uh, Scotland, uh, many English people haven't ever been to Scotland. It's way up North. Um, so it's a uh, far away. It's not like her being in Windsor. If, if, if it today was, if the queen was, um, uh, on her sickbed in Windsor, the streets of Windsor uh, outside of the castle would be packed, I think, with people. Uh, now there are some people at uh, Buckingham Palace, um, but it's uh, slightly different. The Queen hasn't spent much time in Buckingham Palace. So, I mean, the Queen in the last couple of years, I mean, to be honest, has been a very distant kind of star. I mean, she's there. We've seen glimpses of her on the virtually uh, on on Zoom. She she makes her Christmas announcement. She's done she's done some things, 
um, but she's been kind of fading uh, away from from close on view. I mean, I think as Jen was just saying, I mean, they're just remarkable images of the Queen in the past. Um, when she went after the the fire at Grenfell Tower and, you know, was meeting people and kind of mourning, I mean, mourning with them. I mean, you know, we haven't seen that queen in now a few years um, because of her health. Um, so uh, Balmoral Castle is um, is a ways away. It, it, she might not even come home in a, in a coffin by train. It might be too long a trip. Maybe she comes back in, in a play. Mm. Yeah, a, a ways away uh, in, in, in many senses, Bill, clearly. Um, Jen, you know, what is the public relationship like with Prince Charles? And will there be the expectation when he someday, the expectation is, uh, does become king, that, that he will also be able to have that um, availability, that, that while distant, the, you know, the occasional human touch that helps Britons feel connected to and appreciative of the royal family? Yeah, that's a good question, Libby, and it's one that comes up a lot. Um, will Charles be as popular as his mother? And I, that definitely will be hard to hard to be. Um, I think he he and Camilla, his wife, they have gained in popularity um, in more recent years with with people saying that um, they have warmed to Camilla more so. Um, and actually, you know, they married in two thousand and five, and they've been together a long time. But there's also a lot of people who are very pro-Diana, you know, they've watched The Crown, um, they're still very much, you know, not 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 particularly fond of, of Charles and Camilla. And I think they will have a challenge carving out um, a new path for the monarchy. You know, there's rumours that Charles wants to streamline the monarchy and um, make it not such a big institution. So who knows, he might take steps to do that. Um, there's other people that I've spoken to before that have said that, or oh, maybe Charles will just pass pass the crown like he'll pass it straight to William and there's others that say well he's waited so long for this moment to become king you know he became heir in waiting I think when he was about three years old um so I, I personally don't think that Charles would just give it to William um although William is of course very popular as is his wife um Catherine Jen, what are you going to be watching in the coming days and weeks? Of course, we've talked a lot, and James has taken us through the TikTok and timeline of what would happen if the Queen were to pass. But but what will you be watching for? And maybe what should we be tuned into with maybe more insight or uh, more thought as, as someone who who covers uh, you know the the community there, covers culture there, and has watched the Queen? Yeah, I mean. Today, even just seeing BBC news presenters dressed in black, um, you know, we've long known that that would happen. And there's an operational plan, uh, London Bridge, which was leaked, I think, a couple of years ago, that sort of documents what happened um, in the hours and days and weeks after the Queen passes. Um, so I think a lot of us knew um, and are quite aware of, of what will happen after she does indeed die. But... I think the reality of it now that this is such a huge moment in British history um, where the, the nation will be plunged into a sense of mourning is still quite um, unbelievable. And I think there's only a few moments in, in, in people's lives where they can say, I knew where I was when I heard this person was very sick or this person was um, on their way out or this person died. And I think the Queen will definitely um, be one of those people just given... Um, given how, how famous she is around the world. Hmm. Hannah, uh, despite the Queen's uh, sort of flagging health in recent years, and, you know, we've talked about how she wasn't able to make so many of those in-person snap uh, uh, visits and appointments at, when there were tragedies or things happened, um, she is remembered for how she dealt with COVID. So let's talk about how she talked to her people about the COVID crisis in the UK. Well, this was really a moment that showed her sort of symbolic um, role as a head of state, but also sort of an emotional leader of Britain. Uh, back on uh, April 5th in 2020, she made an address to the nation. It was actually only the fifth time that she had made such a special televised broadcast outside of her normal sort of like Christmas Day broadcast, things like that. Um, she said that uh, she spoke to the nation, said it was a time of disruption in the life of the country. She thanked the NHS, the health service that was working so hard in the pandemic at that time. And still, she thanked everyone who was staying at home. And she said that she hoped 
that, um, quote, those who come after us will say that the Britons of this generation were as strong as any, which sort of um, many of those who sort of uh, in, in Britain who think that that's not the case, um, who yearn for this sort of wartime blitz spirit um, and see that as lacking, she was really sort of um, really encouraging the nation, saying that that was still there, that, that, that spirit and that strength to get through that crisis. Um, and she actually also referred to the very first broadcast that she made of that um, as, a, as a teenager in 1940. She was speaking from, from Windsor to children who had been evacuated out of cities um, during World War II, during the Blitz, for their, own, um, for their own safety, including my grandmother, actually. And it kind of just shows how she's, she emerged in these moments of intense national crisis um, for so many generations, spanning such a huge amount of time. She ended that address saying that uh, we should take comfort that while we may have still have more to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Um, today, of course, we're watching these images of the royal family arriving to meet and gather together around her. Rhonda, even as the queen has aged, and of course she is 96, her presence in pop culture has really only grown in recent years as there have been so many movies, films, series uh, uh, dramatizing the life of the queen and the royal family. Yeah, you sort of see surges of interest uh, in pop culture in the queen. You've seen it uh, certainly in the 90s when uh, Charles uh, and Diana were having their split. You've seen it most recently with the marriage of Harry. Uh, so you do see times when uh, people seem to be more engaged or more interested in the royal family. But even that there have been those surges, there's still just been a consistency of so many people wanting to follow them, wanting to know more about them. I would suspect that because we don't have anything to match that here in the U.S., that's what makes it so interesting. We talked moments ago about the fact that we don't have any sort of funeral or memorials like what we might see when she passes. Uh, it certainly is not uh, in an equivalent when you think of the state funerals that we cover for presidents. Those only last just a few days. Um, but this is something that will have global impact. And I think sort of the, uh, the enduring allure of uh, Queen Elizabeth and her family is because others don't experience this. And it's so interesting that this monarchy has lasted this long through generation after generations. And I would suspect that's one of the, the reasons why it attracts so much interest. Jen Hassan, is the Queen viewed as someone from a different era? Uh, is she as robustly alive as she comes across to many of us outside of the UK when we watch all of these, you know, sometimes saucy, you know, dramatizations of her early life and even uh, the dramas that play out behind the closed doors of the royal family residences even today? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question, Libby, because you look at her now in these images and she's a sweet little old lady with her walking cane. And um, of course, the crown really brought to life her, her earlier days, like when she first came to the throne, um, when she was in her mid 20s and has sort of shown another side um, to her, you know, explored her relationship with, with her sister. Um, and of course, that relationship with Prince Philip, um, who of course died last year, and what it was like um, for her to try and navigate becoming a monarch, but also a wife and a mother. And I think at the moment, of course, people look at her to be this sort of frail, um, shrunken old lady that we saw meeting uh, the new prime minister just a couple of days ago. But of course, um, she has throughout the years and the decades um, shown completely different sides um, of herself to the British public. That said, she has always remained quite a private person um, and that's why today's announcement from the palace regarding her health um, really did send people into a bit of a panic because that's unusual from the palace they don't just put out statements um, about her you know her health issues um, unless it's a pretty no you know unless it's a big deal really let's bring in Mary Jordan a national political correspondent uh, Mary talk to us about the Queen and Prince Charles. And we've certainly been reviewing the Queen's legacy today and talking about the relationships she has with the British public, but also her family. Um, but talk to us about the differences and similarities between the Queen and her son, Charles. Um, well, that's a great question, because in the coming days, we, Prince Charles is going to become King Charles. And the focus is going to shift to him. And 
uh, because of all the books and movies that have been written about that family, we know that it wasn't uh, always an easy relationship. Uh, even when he was young, she was away a lot, and there was talk about how few hugs he had. The idea that we even know that is fascinating. Um, he definitely had a better relationship with his mother than he did with his father, Prince, Prince Philip. Um, but at times, I think there was, you know, disappointments and, uh, you know, he was the oldest son. A lot of people have been saying, you know, the guy is 73 years old. Prince Charles is 73 years old. Give the guy a chance. Um, and it looks like now he's going to get a chance. By uh, what we're hearing, though, is that there have been, they've been together a lot recently. No doubt uh, this woman who talked about duty and tradition her whole life were talking about the transition and giving him advice. We hit the Queen's Jubilee uh, this summer, Mary, uh, seeing her 70 years on the throne. And there was a lot of a question of, at some point, would she choose to step down and turn things over to her son? She has not uh, elected to do that. And so Charles has had, I would imagine, a complex relationship with uh, what duty does mean to him and what it will mean to him someday. They're so different in that respect. Um, you know, I mean, many people talk about how outspoken even on controversial and sticky issues, Prince Charles is. That's something the Queen would never do, right? She's mums the word. Um, he talks, um, but you know, on the other hand, he's a modern guy. He, he came up in a different era, completely different era. Uh, he's more extravagant. He, his tastes are more extravagant. I think that there's gonna be a lot of focus in coming days about, you know, if he spends a lot more money when he is the monarch, then his mom, there'll be talk about that. But people will also remember that back in the 70s, when no one else was talking about the environment, or very few were, and sustainability, Prince Charles was. Um, I met him many times, uh, I mean many, I met him several times when I was in London, and I met him at Georgetown University uh, not that long ago when he came to give a speech about food. You know, the idea, some people used to say he was kind of a crackpot. He was talking to his plants and talking about sustainable food. Well, you know, the world, uh, a lot of people now think that he was kind of a visionary. Uh, he was talking about how important food is to diet. And he gave a pretty big uh, and interesting speech at Georgetown University not long ago. Um, their demeanors are different. Um, they have a different following. Nobody is ever going to match. Uh, the affection um, and admiration uh, by the world that the Queen does. Uh, and so Prince Charles is going to have a tough time, um, but it's going to be a very interesting time um, when he takes over. Uh, Mary, as we uh, consider the Queen's life and legacy, as we watch her health here, what is on your mind about the Queen's time uh, reigning over uh, the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth. Uh, what is on your mind? Well, she, uh, in 2007, um, she was coming to the United States. That was her last trip, official trips. She, it was a big deal. She was going to Jamestown. And I happened to be in London, along with my husband and Washington Post colleague, Kevin Sullivan, and we were invited to Buckingham Palace. You know, and so we, we go into this unbelievably grand, place, you know, literally gold thrones and priceless paintings. And then you see this little woman who makes you so at ease. She just seemed super down to earth. She talked to um, us and she also talked to the younger people first who were standing next to us and they were Americans in um, the UK rowing. And she said, turn over your hands when she heard that they were rowers and to see the calluses. And that's her magic. What I think about is the magic of a down-to-earth woman who had this opulent royal life. Mary, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, the flag at Buckingham Palace has been lowered, uh, you see there, to half staff. And it is now official. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II, the longest-serving monarch of the United Kingdom, has died. She was 96 years old. You can see there, not only that flag, but flags across the nation are being lowered now. 
She is surrounded by her family at her home in Balmoral Castle. And you know, it was just days ago that we saw her welcoming the new British Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II has died at age 96 years old. This is the breaking news at this moment. You see there the live image at Buckingham Palace. We know that really her entire family has uh, really sped to Balmoral Castle to be with her. James, give us a sense of the scale of this moment. She was served by 15 British prime ministers, 14 U.S. presidents served during her reign, seven popes. But more than any statistics, Queen Elizabeth has embodied the British stiff upper lip during more than 70 years on the throne. She is the leader, uh, the epitome of so much stability uh, in, in Britain, in the United Kingdom, they are very much defined by who their leaders are. We think of the Victorian age. And today is the end of the second Elizabethan age. And now a, a new age begins for the United Kingdom. Mary Jordan, react to the news of the Queen's passing. Well, I think it's one of those moments I just got a tingle um, because, you know, it's, there's very few moments like this. It's like when JFK got shot and we heard he was dead, when the, there was a moon landing. This is a marker and people will remember kind of what they were doing. Um, and right around the world, you know, Queen Elizabeth is not just a huge deal uh, in Europe and in America, in Africa and um, throughout the world. She's traveled there, they know her. She's not just uh, a, a queen, you know, there's quite a lot of countries that have queens, but she kind of is one of the icons of our time. And so I guess my reaction is a little bit of a tingle and a, a bow uh, to her. The Washington Post, as uh, I, I look at Adrian Higgins' uh, piece about her, uh, describes her as the seemingly eternal monarch who became a bright but inscrutable beacon of continuity in the United Kingdom. Uh, Mary, that, that continuity was so essential, 70 years on the throne. What does this change mean uh, for the monarchy? It's a big, big change. Um, and Prince Charles has really got a challenge ahead of him. Uh, you know, people talk about not wanting to follow a great speaker or, or anything great. You don't want to be the person that comes next, let alone somebody who, you know, the public has mixed feelings about. Everybody knows about, you know, his difficult times when he was married to a very beloved Princess Diana and going out with his current wife, Camilla. But, you know, time also heals things, and Camilla and Charles, um, you know, have been clearly close to the Queen. I think that's going to matter a lot. Um, Prince Charles is 73 years old, and uh, he has weathered a lot himself. But it is going to be a challenge in the coming um, days. He's going to now go around the country. That was clearly planned to get some support for himself. Uh, no, he's been working on speeches. And it's going to be very interesting what he says. Uh, Jen Hassan there in London, uh, wh what is on your mind as we watch this unfold? We know that everything really changes in this moment. Yeah, Libby, I mean, I'm just sat here thinking that she met with the outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the incoming Prime Minister um, Liz Truss just two days ago. Um, so I've been sat here just thinking about that and what an incredible testament that is to her character, um, that while um, my colleague Bill Booth noted that, yes, she has faded somewhat from the public eye and she has handed over a lot of her duties um, over the last couple of years, um, the fact that she, she, she did that just two days ago um, when she was possibly um, suffering or, or not in great health at the time, um, she was determined to meet the new president, um, the new prime minister, sorry, of, of Great Britain. Um, I think that is really, that really does just sum, sum her up and her work ethic. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it is one of those moments that the nation 
will, will never really be the same again. And I think there's a lot of people that have never, ever known life here without the Queen on the throne. In fact, a really small percentage of people that just don't know life without her. I mean, you know, we have the national anthem, um, God Save Our Gracious Queen. That will, of course, change um, to King because we have a King right now. So, yeah, there's a lot of change coming. This, of course, coincides with the fact that we also have a new Prime Minister. Um, so there's a lot of change right now. We're in a cost of living crisis. We're dealing with the aftermath of the coronavirus pandemic and the fallout of um, the Brexit vote. And it's just, it feels very... Um, very, very uncertain right now on British soil. We're seeing people gather, Jen, outside of Buckingham Palace. Uh, what do you anticipate the national mourning will be like? Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing we will probably be able to compare it to or expect that it would be like will be um, when Princess Diana died in 1997. And I, I was quite young at the time, and I remember um, as a young child going there um, and to the palace and to Kensington Palace and seeing just of flowers and as you can see there's already crowds um, outside Buckingham Palace now there's tourists in the rain huddling under umbrellas and lovers of the monarchy um, putting flowers down already so I can only imagine what the next few days are going to look like um, in London at the palace um, but of course in Scotland in Balmoral where she has been staying since July um, so yeah I think we can we can expect to see a lot of public mourning Thanks so much, Jen, uh, and good luck with all of your reporting in the subsequent days. Uh, Hannah Jewell, this is a pivotal moment for the monarchy, but also for the people of the United Kingdom. Yeah, Jen really put it well, saying how the, the, the scale of the change is happening at the same time. You know, on this, this minor scale or, you know, comparatively minor scale of having a new prime minister two days ago, what that entails, a uh, change of government. Um, but also a change of monarch for the first time in 70 years, which um, only the elderly can now remember a time before that happened. I think we're going to see, um, you know, in addition to this, this carefully planned out 10-day series of ceremonies, we're going to see a total um, media focus on this and a life focus, a cultural focus. I think uh, Britain is going to be a very different place for the next 10 days, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot from um, from regular British people on the ground who um, reacting to this emotional moment um, over this this time period. I think it can't be overstated for some people how how central the Queen is to their sort of sense of national identity and 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 self. Um, and uh, it's just going to be um, unlike I think anything that we've seen. Um, in the U.S. in terms of a public display of, of grieving and, and mourning. Uh, James, uh, generally put into context for us what else is happening right now in the lives of uh, people in the United Kingdom. And just earlier today, before news of the Queen's illness uh, broke, one of the top stories in the Washington Post was about the European Central Bank announcing the largest ever increase in interest rates. And we're watching Europe and, uh, and the U.K. deal with this issue of inflation that we're seeing as well, the war in Ukraine, economic woes. Uh, there, there are a lot of fearful things coming down the pike for people's pocketbooks in the coming weeks and months. How does that all factor into this moment as this nation and the world now has to sort of cope with the loss of someone who has been so stable and so present? Well, she helped them get through these other tough periods. It adds to the list of challenges facing Charles, uh, who is going to become king uh, and has legitimacy in, in the sense that he has been anointed, uh, but has to earn the respect of the British people. Uh, the, the challenge is very real. The, uh, there are going to be energy shortages this winter. Uh, the interest rates are going through the roof. Inflation in Britain is actually more than twice as bad as it is here in the United States. Uh, it, it is the, there is a cost of living crisis. Uh, and the fact that the queen has died, you know, she's, she's only five feet, four inches tall, but uh, she was such a, a vastly larger presence. Uh, the fact that she has, has passed away does offer her son a chance to remind Britain of all they've been through before in a country with so much nostalgia for the past uh, that there will be continuity. Uh, she has represented stability, but uh, she 
she also was the monarch, and the this is a monarch that dates back uh, a thousand years uh, since the Norman landing in 1066. Uh, this is this is continuity, and this is a chance for Charles to earn the affection of the people by reminding them of all they've been through before to assure them that they can get through the, the many challenges ahead. James, this is quite a start for Liz Truss as prime minister. Yeah, and it, you, it, you hate to play politics and think politics at a moment like this, but this will certainly uh, give her some uh, bounce uh, in the polls, almost certainly. Uh, this is, uh, Liz Truss is someone who's just won a conservative party contest, uh, but is not uh, liked or thought highly of by most Britons. Uh, and this is a chance for her to, uh, just as uh, happened with Tony Blair after Princess Diana's death in the 1990s, really channel the feelings of the British people. Uh, this is a real opportunity for her uh, to, to show that she's a stateswoman, to put herself on the global stage. We see her there. Uh, this is uh, this is someone, Liz Truss, who uh, 25 years ago when she was at Oxford was against the monarchy and has uh, become a, a very vocal proponent of the monarchy. Uh, this, is, this is really a, a, a really shocking way to start your tenure as prime minister. Uh, and, and there's really no analog for it for us Americans who are watching because we just don't have a, a constitutional monarchy. Uh, the way that they do. Uh, a parliament is going to convene immediately. Uh, there will be both in the House of Commons and the parliament, uh, and in the Commonwealths as well. You'll see the Scottish parliament uh, gather. And it, it, she, this is the head of state. This is the, the woman whose face is on their currency, uh, who, you know, who's, who's been so present for so long. And Rhonda, the Queen outlived so many political careers, uh, both here in the United States as well as in her home country. That's right. We've been talking about before how the first U.S. president she met was Truman, and she's met all of them since except uh, LBJ. But this is really uh, a moment uh, for, of course, uh, Britain, but uh, the globe. And it's a moment uh, that's of historic nature because it will likely be deeply felt by people who uh, speak different languages, who have different cultures, but they all know her. They all have watched her reign uh, do diff do through different eras. So this is, this is a pretty unique and significant moment in our history. And, you know, we've, we've talked about how she started her job with that sense of duty. She is said to have been influenced by uh, how her father felt after he had to take over the throne, after his brother Edward abdicated the throne. Uh, and she watched that sense of duty. She watched him die in office, and she knew she had to take it on. And we saw that sense of duty throughout the entire time. And up until this week, as we've been talking about, how she met uh, with the outgoing and the incoming prime ministers, which is a part of her duties, uh, she kept that going, you know, 48 hours ago. So uh, this was a, a woman that uh, is, of course, well-loved by her people, but the globe right now uh, is beginning to respond, and it's a, a deeply significant moment. The breaking news at this hour, Queen Elizabeth II has died at the age of 96. Mary Jordan, how do you sum up her life and legacy? I think she was like a, a history book. You could kind of flip to any page and she was there. Um, I mean, she lived a century. Uh, she met everybody. She outlasted uh, more than a dozen presidents and a dozen prime ministers. Um, and Mary, can I just have you pause for one moment if people are looking at their screen and wondering what's happening. That is the official announcement of the Queen's passing being posted there on the gates of Buckingham Palace. And you see so many people with their arms up and their phones trying to capture that moment uh, because they were there. And this is part of the procedure that rolls out uh, in these initial minutes and hours after the Queen's death. And so that is the royal announcement going up right there. Uh, please continue, Mary. And just like that, um, that's another page in this book. She is so significant that she's going to have a page that's, you know, when, when other people die, you don't have this, this announcement that everybody wants to draw near to. People will travel hundreds of miles from all over to get a picture of that announcement. Uh, in the days ahead, and there's going to be a lot 
of ceremonies, people f flooding the city. Um, you know, I think we're going to hear speeches. They'll, no doubt uh, leaders from around the world will descend on London. Um, this, you know, she really kind of was the history of the last century. She was always there. She added to it. And the, perhaps the best thing that she did was to just be there. You know, she, she talked herself. She always kind of was self-deprecating and said, you know, I'm not that smart. I, I didn't have the greatest education. Uh, but she was always there, and that really counted. A and now she's not. Mary, she is such a familiar face, such a familiar presence, and yet a little bit inscrutable, right? Because there is that distance there, that privacy there. What was Queen Elizabeth like? You know, she, uh, she used to go to um, her favorite place where she ended up dying in Balmoral. And she would invite a few other people for dinner. And I talked to one of them and he said, you know, she got up and she actually did the dishes. Um, I think people don't see that side, that she was really kind of normal. You know, she liked her dogs and her horses. She did the dishes sometimes. Uh, and she um, smiled and she was funny. Uh, when she met the Americans, and I was part of that in 2007 in Buckingham Palace, heading to the States, you know, she kind of cracked jokes. There was a, an American businessman, and she was going around saying, what do you do, what do you do? And then when he said um, that he was a huge um, maker of pancake and waffle mix from the United States, and she kind of smiled and she talked about all the things that people eat. But she was a little devilish, you know, and she was, you know, she just, she liked a good joke. She liked you to kind of wonder what she was thinking. Um, and I even was asking people, like, she's in her own house there in Buckingham Palace. Why does she have that little handbag? Um, but she, you know, she wanted to have her Kleenex and her glasses right with her. She, she was just one of a kind. I think. Hannah, let's talk about the legacy that she leaves on uh, this United Kingdom and, uh, and, and what state she leaves it in, Hannah. I mean, uh, as, as people have been saying, this is sort of a really extreme moment for Britain, a time um, when energy bills are set to increase many orders of magnitude higher. You have a new prime minister coming in who not only has to sort of prove herself uh, in a time uh, as a leader in this very intense moment for the British psyche, but also uh, the way she became prime minister. Unlike in the US, she has not won an election. She... I just want to interrupt you because we can read oh, yeah. what that placard says there. The queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The king and the queen consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Go ahead, Hannah. So you have this moment um, of, of intense need for stable leadership. You can see the, that which um, the Queen has provided, at least symb symbolically, for the last 70 years. But actually, a very small proportion of the British public has had a hand in selecting the new prime minister. Only Conservative Party paid up members um, select this, and as has been the case for the last few prime ministers. You know, we've had we've seen four in as many years in Britain. Um, throughout that, the Queen was a constant. I think that um, it's such a looking ahead to this winter in Britain, to cost of living crisis, to um, a new prime minister, all of this turmoil. I think that this is going to just add a, a level to that and another layer to that sort of um, intense sense of change in that country. The images we're seeing on our screen, Buckingham Palace, of course, and then in the upper left, Balmoral Castle and the gates where the queen has died at the age of 96. And in the lower left of your screen, 10 Downing Street. Uh, James, the place the cameras are all trained on right now uh, as we watch to see how the very fresh and new prime minister handles this moment. This is a big test for Liz Truss. This is a big opportunity uh, for her to speak to the country, uh, to channel the feelings of the populace, of the queen's subjects. Uh, and she just saw the queen, one of the very last non-family members to see the queen just the day before yesterday uh, with her predecessor, Boris Johnson. Uh, and uh, he, she is the, I believe the 15th prime minister during her reign, uh, the first being Winston Churchill. It's a reminder that, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, 
Winston Churchill was born in the, the I think the 1870s. Uh, it, it just it, it reaches back so far in history, this uh, Elizabethan period. Mary Jordan, what are the concerns that Queen Elizabeth uh, had and that perhaps uh, her family has about the survival of the monarchy? And surely she looked to the future and anticipated and thought about what would happen after her passing. Well, for one thing, I'm sure it's not lost on people that she died in Scotland. Uh, there is a pretty strong independence movement among Scots. And that's going to come up, right? I mean, you know, she was one of the things that held it together. Uh, she was the unity across all of the UK. Uh, Will Prince Charles, he's going to no doubt address that. Um, and then more broadly, um, you know, there's quite a lot of people, every opinion poll that's taken, who says the monarchy may have lasted for a thousand years, but it's time for it to go into the <laughs> trash heap of history. It's too expensive, too ridiculous. You know, I mean, really, is this a job? Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I think that in the near term, there is going to be such a, a, a profound um, need to have all this tradition, to see all of the ceremony that you're going to, that's going to roll out in the next 10 days, that it will give, uh, most likely, a big boost to the monarchy. Uh, but down the line, um, there's people around the Commonwealth is still kind of fraying. Uh, you know, once the great British Empire has shrunk, and it, it could shrink more. So, James, talk us through what happens now, even over the next 24 hours. Yeah, they call it Operation uh, London Bridge, uh, and now the metaphorical London Bridge is down. Uh, you already are seeing in some of these pictures uh, that we're bringing you from outside Buckingham Palace and in downtown London, uh, barricades being set up. Uh, this is a, a massive logistical undertaking. Uh, the British military, they don't have the Posse Comitatus Act uh, like we do in the United States. The British military will deploy uh, in the streets of London to ensure security, uh, crowd control. Uh, this is gonna be much bigger than the Jubilee we saw uh, in June. Uh, and to just echo what Mary was saying, she mentioned Scotland, which is obviously the uh, first task in, for, for Charles to save the monarchy and to prevent it from dissolution. But there are a lot of other places in the Commonwealth, uh, the 14 realms of more than 50 nations. I think of Australia, uh, which in 1999 rejected a referendum to become a republic out of loyalty to Queen Elizabeth, not the United Kingdom. Uh, so the test for Charles now in the coming days, as he goes on a tour around the United Kingdom, is to uh, to be a voice of reassurance and to channel the outpouring of sympathy, the rally around the flag effect that comes whenever a monarch falls, to preserve this monarchy that has lasted for literally a millennia. Hannah, let's talk about what younger Britons uh, may view as the Queen's legacy and um, h how they've seen her in recent years. So while the Queen has remained just overwhelmingly popular, particularly compared to Charles and others in the royal family, um, we have seen this sort of generational divide among those who are older being more likely to want Britain to, re to or the UK to, to remain a monarchy those who are younger are more likely to want a republic. Um, you see a different sort of scale of the emotional connection to the royal family and to the queen specifically, which makes sense given um, how, how, long, um, how long she was on the throne and how for older British people she has been there for their whole lives and, and, and for all of that time and that building that emotional resonance, being there for all these big moments in the history um, of their country and, and of their lives, having grown up with her, you see that. And, and you see less, um, you see more uh, interest among young people in sort of, um, I, I, it's hard to say how, how Charles is going to pull, I think particularly among young people. I think there's the fondness for the queen. Um, I think we will have to wait to see official sort of polling around feelings about him and the king and how that relates to the feelings about the monarchy as a whole. I'm very interested among younger people because unlike the queen who remains so steadfastly um, outwardly apolitical for this entire reign, Charles has been involved in more sort of 
scandals and, and more accusations of, of getting involved in British public in politics, not only in this sort of symbolic constitutional monarch way, but in a more active sort of lobbying sense, um, which, which has not helped to increase his popularity. And I think there is a, a, a more of a sense among young people that um, are more willing to sort of question the longevity of the monarchy and its necessity to British public life. Of course, so much of um, the British economy and, and tourism is, is built up around its history and particularly the history of its monarchy. Um, but uh, unclear how younger people will see that, that value going forward, I think. Mary Jordan, uh, even though some of the ceremony hasn't happened yet and uh, the proceedings, Charles is now king. Yes, he is. It's a huge moment. He's been waiting for it for a very, very long time. Um, and, it, and he, just this summer, you know, he, he had to deal with um, big, big headlines in the British papers that questioned, you know, how he used money for his charities. Um, he had, for instance, uh, in the name of this charity, had been given literally a suitcase full of cash, uh, a lot of cash, a million pounds. And people said, look, you know, this is legal, um, but this is the difference between Charles and his mother. You know, yes, it's legal. Yes, it's going to charity. There's, there was no talk that um, it was, a, uh, you know, in any way improper. But was it really a good PR move? <laughs> you know, that's, I don't think so. A and so he, he is taking over with a lot of people going, let's see how this goes, you know? And no doubt he's been preparing and talking to his mother over the last several weeks. They have spent a lot of time together. And, and I think you're gonna hear him say what she told him in the final days of her life. Rhonda, talk to us about the relationship that the Queen has had uh, with world leaders. And, uh, you know, it's not just the prime ministers who, of course, she has met with, some of whom she was able to develop ongoing relationships with. Uh, but talk to us about her presence on the world stage. Well, it has an incredible span, and she, of course, has met uh, with a number of our U.S. presidents throughout history. Uh, and some of them have uh, disclosed uh, the conversations that they have had. I know uh, when President Obama and also President Bush met with her, they were really enamored with her, that sense of duty, uh, that sense of she, of course, is and could be above politics, something that uh, elected officials often can't escape. Um, they've talked about her grace. Uh, it seems as if every readout that you've ever had of a U.S. president meeting her they have enjoyed it. It has been the highlight uh, of uh, part of their administration. Nixon was someone who uh, deeply loved uh, his meeting with her. Um, so she has had this span of time where she has had that opportunity to meet so many world leaders, U.S. world leaders. Uh, she's also uh, has been known to meet uh, others in history who uh, may not have received a, a favorable liking, like Idi Amin. Uh, she met with him, and, and that uh, sort of was a famous meeting where uh, he told her about some plans he had uh, for a, an invasion, and she was able to do some diplomatic work around that. So there was a lot through history, if you look at who she's met. She's often done it out of duty, especially if they have been uh, there in Britain. She has met with them, and she's also done uh, other visits as well. But again, it all speaks to her uh, length of time, that all that she has seen, all the politics that she's seen, the geopolitics, uh, countries being created or countries uh, dropping off from the Commonwealth. Uh, she just saw so much. And you, uh, just as Mary said, it's going to be interesting if we hear Charles discuss anything that she told him in her final words with, with him and if she wanted to impart that sense of duty that she apparently adhered to. World leaders are uh, giving their condolences and reacting uh, to the news of Queen Elizabeth's death, ranging from the NATO Secretary General to uh, the Dutch Prime Minister to India's Prime Minister. Uh, Narendra Modi uh, tweeting out about his memorable meetings, he called them, with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And he said that during one of the meetings, uh, she showed him the handkerchief that Mahatma Gandhi 
gifted her on her wedding, a gesture that he said he will cherish. Uh, James, this is just the start of the uh, global leaders and their outpouring of uh, sympathy for the British people, the Commonwealth, and the royal family. Many of these countries, of course, were part of the British Empire, uh, including during Queen Elizabeth's reign, uh, when the sun never set on the British Empire. Uh, it, in, in a, it, it really is just such a different world now than the one she inherited. India, of course, a, a, a republic. Uh, and, you know, this special relationship with the United States, uh, it, it, we just learned that President Biden has canceled some scheduled remarks uh, that he was supposed to make about COVID-19 booster shots. Uh, and, and part of that is a, a deference from Washington to let Prime Minister Truss there. Uh, we see the shot of 10 Downing Street give sort of the first comments. We do expect that we will hear uh, from Prince Charles, uh, who is now King Charles, this afternoon. And, and we also know that protocol uh, says that when the Queen died this afternoon, uh, her eyes will be closed by her doctors, and then all of Charles's siblings uh, were to kiss his hand. Uh, it, it was sort of a, a, a very, uh, uh, what might seem archaic to us, but a, a British tradition uh, that dates back centuries. Charles is- To kiss the hand of the of new, the new king. king. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Charles is 72, uh, and you know, we, it's funny because our perspective on 72 has changed. I guess 72 is the new, uh, is 62, uh, 73, 73, yeah, 73. 73, a recent birthday. Uh, but that's younger than our, our president, Joe Biden, who's 79 and Donald Trump, our former president, who's 76. Uh, and, but it is, uh, it's a challenging and demanding job, uh, for, for someone uh, who's 73. You know, Hannah Jewell, as we see these, uh, international leaders, uh, weigh in and, and pay their respects to Queen Elizabeth. Uh, you can't divorce the reaction from just how much uh, power the royal family once had as a symbol of England and Great Britain and the Commonwealth. And I'd like to hear from you a little bit about how that is uh, while both there's a lot of loyalty among Commonwealth nations, uh, Commonwealth countries for the Queen, um, there are also some very deep and complex and and bitter memories of of the British Empire and its legacy. That's exactly right, Libby. I think the the relationship between Commonwealth countries um, and the Queen and the monarchy it, it depends a lot on how Britain got to these places in the first place and why. Right? Whether it is some settler colonies um, with Canada, Australia, New Zealand versus these African and and actually in Caribbean nations where the purpose of the British Empire in these places was um, extraction of wealth through slavery. And this is obviously a hard thing to talk about in, in this moment, but is really shapes how so many people in these countries, particularly um, in the Caribbean, feel about the monarchy. And there have been some movements among their leaders and among their public to try and break away from the monarchy. And I wonder, um, uh, you know, in the face of still a lot of popular um, um, support for the Queen at that time, and I wonder if if um, that is something that the Queen could, could keep those relationships alive, whereas can the next generations, can the next three um, heirs to the throne uh, continue to sort of convince Commonwealth countries that have a less warm relationship um, with Britain and, and have a lot more uh, that Britain needs to account for in those countries? Can they can they keep their purpose alive for the next three heirs who are who are all men who are all um, I mean after uh, Charles obviously we get into the next generations um, and indeed will those royals be interested in maintaining the Commonwealth which was such a huge part of the Queen's focus um, or will they see a new more limited role a less global role for the royal family um, moments like this and of course this big ceremony these these ten days are going to be crucial in sort of um, cementing that sort of passage of power. Um, it's going to be crucial in trying to tell this narrative of why the royal family um, should go on in, the eyes, in, in their eyes, and um, particularly a harder case to sell perhaps in other parts of the world, um, touched by, by the British Empire in, in more violent ways. 
Mary Jordan, how important is this period of, of national mourning and ceremony? And I do see the door of 10 Downing Street open, so let's go to Prime Minister Liz Truss right now. by the news that we have just heard from Balmoral. The death of Her Majesty the Queen is a huge shock to the nation and to the world. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. She ascended the throne just after the Second World War. She championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. Her, her life of service stretched beyond most of our living memories. In return, she was loved and admired by the people in the United Kingdom and all around the world. She has been a personal inspiration to me and to many Britons. Her devotion to duty is an example to us all. Earlier this week, at 96, she remained determined to carry out her duties as she appointed me as her 15th Prime Minister. Throughout her life, she's visited more than 100 countries and she has touched the lives of millions around the world. In the difficult days ahead, we will come together with our friends across the United Kingdom the Commonwealth and the world to celebrate her extraordinary lifetime of service. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty King Charles III. With the King's family, we mourn the loss of his mother. And as we mourn, we must come together as a people to support him, to help him bear the awesome responsibility that he now carries for us all. We offer him our loyalty and devotion, just as his mother devoted so much to so many for so long. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. Prime Minister Liz Truss ending with those words, God save the King. Mary Jordan, it makes it all the more real as you hear this perspective from a woman who met with the Queen just a couple of days ago. Think of the last time that the whole world kind of stopped and watched something. You know, I think that the Queen's parting gift will be that in a, a time of great turmoil and division, there'll be unity on one thing. You know, there'll be eyes on the ceremonies to come in London for the, all these days ahead. Uh, and that's really rare. Uh, and that is kind of who she was and what the new prime minister was just saying, you know, duty up until the last moment. She wanted to make sure that the new prime minister, she met her, um, and then of course just died shortly after. But the unity that she can kind of bring the world at this moment and the reminder, you know, that duty counts um, and that uh, tradition counts. And I think that in the days ahead, many people will kind of thank her even in her her time of passing for what she's leaving us all with and after that there'll be discussion about the monarchy because the idea of people having to kiss the hand of prince charles is going to get a lot of airtime but not right away 
but it will because the monarchy really just changed. I think it is forever going to be different. As long as she was there, it was one way. Uh, but now that she's gone, and, and again, we have a week and we have a lot of ceremonies to get to and a kind of a moment of silence and unity, but then there's going to be discussion about what we're going to keep and, or what UK is going to keep and what they're not. Um, and I would say that there's a lot of things that strike people, especially young people, as silly. Uh, and then there's a lot of things that really are important. And there'll be a huge discussion uh, in the UK and in the Commonwealth. Mary, we've uh, gotten a statement from Buckingham Palace. And even who it's from is significant because it says a statement from His Majesty the king at the time of the queen's death and here's what it says the death of my beloved mother her majesty the queen is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family we mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much loved mother i know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country the realms and the commonwealth and by countless people around the world during this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. A statement uh, from Charles, uh, no longer Prince Charles, Mary. He's been waiting for this moment for a long time. You know, his mother became the monarch, uh, you know, 70 years ago. Uh, she was really young. Now he's in his 70s and he's taking over. He is prepared, he's thought about it, talked about it, he's got his speeches ready. Uh, it's going to be a really big moment and I think we're going to hear a lot about the discussion with his mother and maybe at least a little bit about how it's going to change. Hannah, let, let's talk some more about what it was like to see this new prime minister come out and speak uh, to the people uh, on such a pivotal day. Um, while the news was already well known, I mean, the tweet from from uh, the, the royal account has more than uh, 1.3 million uh, interactions already uh, just in the last hour. She really was the first person to come out and give voice and image to this moment of transition, Hannah. It was such an important moment, I think, for her tenure as prime minister and actually just feels like such an incredibly just sort of the whiplash of the 180 from going from a quite a sort of bitter uh, Tory leadership contest in which she successfully won over a sort of relatively small slice of the British public to become prime minister. Um, and is any electoral campaign anywhere around the world coming with all the sort of, you know, gaffes and political machinations and, and, and maneuvers that, that come with the realm of electoral politics to just such a short amount of time later um, having to come out dressed in all black, speak outside 10 Downing Street, um, kind of introduce herself uh, to the country in this context of being, you know, the, the third British, uh, female British prime minister um, on the occasion of the death of, I believe, the eighth reigning queen in British history. That's uh, those who were sovereigns, not just sort of queen consorts, but a sovereign in her own right. Um, and actually, Britain has only recently changed its, its rules about um, about um, heirs and female and male heirs. And so uh, you see this uh, Liz Truss referring to the passing of the second Elizabethan age, um, you know, one that was even longer than the first, the longest reigning monarch, spoke about what a huge shock this was to the nation and the world, um, and referred to the extraordinary achievement um, of the queen having presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years, she said. So you saw her keep that, those remarks, you know, quite quite short, somber. Um, today is, is not about her, of course, but it is uh, really a hu an un unbelievably huge test um, as the, the 15th prime minister to have served under the queen's um, reign uh, to be the one tasked with, with making a speech like that. James, we think of ages as something out of history books, so it is uh, sort of all the more uh, grounding and sobering to hear the Prime Minister talk about this, as Hannah said, as the passing of the second Elizabethan age. Yeah, Libby, it, it, it's something to hear someone, I mean, that was a, a great, concise speech, uh, describe the death of a 96-year-old as a, a huge shock, which is what she called it, but that's what it is. It is, more than three and four Britons have never known life without Queen Elizabeth as their monarch, and uh, you know, the, to, to call her the rock on which modern Britain was built is not 
an exaggeration. Uh, and she did capture the spirit of Great Britain. She does leave a dramatic legacy. It, it is difficult for a prime minister to offer hyperbole in a speech like this because it's so true that she is so foundational to the, the British experience of the last century. Rhonda, tell us about the reaction here in the United States from political leaders. Yeah, almost immediately I've been seeing reaction and emails come through from members of Congress. We've uh, heard from Speaker Pelosi, also Mitch McConnell, the minority leader over in the Senate. He opened up today's Senate floor action with uh, mention of Queen Elizabeth's health and saying that she would be in uh, their thoughts and prayers. Uh, his statement uh, just now says, today all Americans stand with our great friends across the Atlantic in mourning and in the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The decades of Her Majesty's reign saw an intense deepening of the special relationship and close bond between the U.S. and the U.K. And Speaker Pelosi also put out a statement just a few minutes ago. Uh, she talked about the time she was honored to be on the floor of the House during the historic address to Congress in 1991, uh, where uh, they welcomed Queen Elizabeth. And uh, she also shares her uh, moments of reflection as well about the Queen. So this does extend uh, to elected officials here. I suspect we'll also get some announcements and response from other global leaders. But this is something that is certainly deeply felt uh, by those that may have been able to meet her uh, in their capacities as elected officials and those who have just watched uh, her reign. Autumn Brewington, let's bring you into the conversation. Uh, opinions editor, you've also been a royal blogger for The Post uh, over the years. Autumn, react to the news uh, that Queen Elizabeth has died. I mean, it's, it's as, as so many of my colleagues have just been saying, it's stunning. She's been queen for more than 70 years. It's in, so many of us have not known a world in which she was not the queen. So it's really just sort of shocking to think about um, what does that look like? What comes next? Even the statement that came from Buckingham Palace, you know, was a statement from the king. And then it was Prime Minister Liz Truss who just said um, the king will be known as King Charles III. But questions like that are things that no one has had to think about in more than 70 years because she's just been, she's been as much of an institution as the one that she's led. Autumn, what will you be thinking about and watching in the days to come? Uh, James has been taking us through the timeline of events. Is this moment really about the past, the future, or a mix of both? So that's a really interesting question, and I think partially the answers might be different for an American audience versus a British audience. Um, I think a lot of people, particularly over the next few days, are going to be looking back and you know, kind of thinking about. Um, the depth and breadth of the Queen's reign, all of her firsts, all of her achievements, and sort of where do they go from here? Um, there is, as I think Mary said, there are going to be a lot of questions of, well, how will Charles do this? And, you know, he's accepted money from these donors, or he said this thing or that thing. Um, a lot of reactions to how um, then Prince Charles, now apparently King Charles, has conducted himself have really been because of, you know, his his outreach to government ministers, you know, his, his comments about politics or um, architecture or climate change, like other sort of issues of the day, these are really in contrast to how Queen Elizabeth has been a political and she, you know, did not get involved with issues of the day, but she was sort of this, um, she was really figurehead leadership. So people are going to be looking to see, does he intend to lead in the way that she led and really defined that role? Will he do something different? I think right away we're going to be seeing a lot of just national mourning and retrospectives and then it will be really interesting to see you know kind of what issues does Charles raise how does he want to start off you know his reign it was really significant in February that at the anniversary of her accession to mark her 70 years on the throne the queen put out a statement that included saying that she hoped when the time came that her son's wife would be known as queen. Mm. That was an issue because, you know, when Charles and Camilla married, Camilla was not particularly popular in Britain and they had said she would be known as princess consort. So this was sort of 
an effort by the queen to ensure there was not controversy at the start of Charles's reign and sort of helping him to start off on a solid footing, letting it be known that she supported this. So that's why the palace could say now the king and queen referring to Charles and Camilla are at Balmoral and taking next steps. Yeah. Um, yeah, Autumn, I, you know, I was just reflecting as I was reading some of your old pieces, even from, you know, less than a year ago at the start of this year, there were questions that you had and things that uh, you recognized that the queen would have to face as she hit her uh, 70 years on the on the throne and celebrated that occasion this summer. And that was one of the, the, the bits of business that at that point you had pointed out sort of left undone. How would a future uh, Camilla be referred to and why is that significant? There were other questions for the queen uh, in terms of just what her idea of uh, a future royal family might look like. Did the queen, as far as we know, lay out for us a sense of what she wanted the monarchy to look like in the future? Um, I don't think she made any specifically sort of public statements about that. And there's been a lot of tension in the royal family about, you know, who would have what particular public sort of uh, taxpayer supported or not supported roles. There has been a lot of talk in the past several years. Um, the key word that I think um, has been sort of used a lot is transition, you know, as they prepare for the transition to the next reign, what would things look like? And there's been a lot of talk about how Charles would oversee a sort of slimmed down, modernized monarchy. So these um, questions, you know, whether, for example, um, when Prince Andrew was removed from his public role, um, it seems as though, you know, there's been a lot of pushing behind the scenes, Andrew kind of lobbying his mother, wanting to be back on like the public stage and Charles and William sort of being opposed to that. The queen hadn't spoken publicly about what her preference was, but um, the fact that, you know, in the wake of sort of some of Andrew's legal troubles and his um, very poor PR moves a couple of years ago, that she removed him from public duties. You know, that sent a message of she was aware of public sentiment. Um, she was not, you know, she did not want to make anything worse by having her second son be, you know, a, a public um, representative of the monarchy. And sort of where Charles goes from here is something that will be closely watched. Um, Hannah, let's go to you for this question of a look back at the past and all the remembrances that will happen over the coming days, and also this looming question of the future. And uh, part of this process is seeing Charles ascend to the throne. So, so we can't ignore the future even as we reflect. This is just such a test of... of how long the monarchy may last going forward forever. You know, this is, um, it, it was so much of its popularity was so tied to the popularity of the queen specifically. Um, we have all this pomp and circumstance coming ahead to sort of create this sort of legitimacy and, and sort of um, ceremony around the new king. Um, and to see how the public will react to this will be very interesting. I think there'll be so much more focus on the passing of the queen, so much more remembrances of her, so much, um, I feel like, speaking to people who are going to come to these the sort of processional routes in London over the next 10 days, um, they're going to be talking about the queen more than anything. Um, and it will really be up to Charles to try and sort of connect himself to his mother's legacy to try and, in honoring her, sort of continue, see that he is picking up where she left off, um, and whether that can be achieved is yet to be seen. But um, again, I mean, everyone has been saying it, but such a such a, a such a shocking shocking in some ways and not in others. Obviously, we know she was very elderly, but um, whenever you have such a huge change to such a, the most important cultural figure in Britain um, after 70 years, I think. Um, it, while we know so much of what's going to happen in terms of the literal the ceremonies, um, each day by day schedule to commemorate this moment, it's also very feels very unknown. All the same, going ahead. Yeah, Hannah, one of our uh, colleagues said earlier so well. Not surprising, but uh, shocking nonetheless, and uh, almost shocking that it, the death of a 96-year-old is shocking. But, but, but there you have it, and there is so much laid out for us to expect, and yet. It will be so new because it's been just so long. James, talk to us about the timeline here and how this is viewed uh, as the start of these next days. A 10-day 
process that is extraordinarily choreographed. Ten days from now, there will be a, a, a royal funeral like none of us uh, ha has ever seen. Uh, London is going to essentially be locked down as uh, people descend. Uh, King Charles is going to embark on a, a royal tour around the kingdom that he now leads. Uh, instead of God save the queen, you will hear a lot of God save the king, as we just heard from Prime Minister Truss. Uh, and there will be a lot of reminiscences about Queen Elizabeth, not just the monarch, but the woman. Uh, you know, someone who loved jigsaw puzzles and watching uh, programs on the BBC, uh, as someone who loved her horses and her corgis, uh, someone who loved on Fridays to sit on a, a comfortable but faded sofa and sip her favorite cocktail of gin and Dubonnet, uh, the liqueur. Uh, there will be a lot of, uh, of, of reminiscences of, of that sort. Uh, we heard many during the Jubilee uh, in 2012 and then again this summer and we'll, we'll hear them with a different sort of tone uh, and you will see sort of this this morning. This is a, for, for a lot of Britons, this is a, a woman who feels like their own grandmother, uh, like they have lost a, a member of their own family, not just a head of state. You know, and, and Mary Jordan, some of these things that made uh, Queen Elizabeth normal let's say, uh, also perhaps belie the role that she had to play. And, and there's always the question, and it can't be divorced, of not only what her role and the role of the monarchy is in British life, but its purpose of existing and, and where the money comes from and how, uh, how Britons either justify and like to have this constant presence or how much they see that it no longer has a use, Mary. I think one of the things that will be different about this transition is that because uh, Prince Charles is already in his 70s and because he's not as well liked as his son William and his wife Kate Middleton, that there's going to be a lot of cameras on not just uh, Charles but the next generation. Um, and the adorable little kids, uh, grandkids that we saw at the Jubilee who stole the show with their little antics. And every time uh, we're going to hear from Charles and probably William and maybe even Kate, uh, they're going to be invoking the Queen because she is still the continuity and she's still the one who everybody loved. But they are going to have to modernize. And, and I could see, for instance, Kate Middleton saying, you know, I talked to the Queen and, you know, all those hats that she wears, I mean, she has like 20 yellow ones and 40 pink ones. Um, she and I said we're going to auction them off uh, for charity. Um, I'm, I'm making that up, but I can see that they, and I do know that they have been brainstorming, you know, how to make it a monarchy that people say, oh, yeah, that works for me, because some of the things don't. Uh, we talked about, you know, some of the bowing uh, to the monarch. That you know, era may have gone, but other things stay. People like pomp and circumstance, and, and they're going to need it. You know, people need it in times of, of like we're going to see now, pa her passing. Um, but I, I think, unlike when she became uh, the queen in 1953 with 20 million people, which was a huge number then watching, the whole world is going to watch this one, and it's not going to be a focus on one woman as it was then, it'll be on Charles and um, his kid uh, who will then succeed him, William and Kate Middleton, who is really popular, and their kids. You know, Mary, there has seemed to be this big buffer, right, between uh, William and Kate's children and the throne, but this huge uh, leap being made to have a 73-year-old now be king changes everything in their lives. It sure does. Um, I mean, Prince Charles, you know, spent his whole life um, not, I mean, he had a lot of publicity um, and, and he had a few scandals to say the least, but he didn't have that intense spotlight that you get when you're number one. Um, and it will be very interesting, but boy, 
I mean, talk about preparing for an exam. Uh, he, he knows every rule. He's been told everything. He's seen every movie. Uh, so I don't think he's going to have uh, that much of a hard time. He told his biographer, um, and who I met at a dinner of all things in London, um, about how much he's prepared for this. And, uh, you know, that, that he, he really wanted it. I think that was the thing I came away with that discussion. He wants to do this, uh, and he wants to have a chance, and, and now he's got it. What's so complicated, Autumn, is that most uh, people coming into power don't have to rely on their mother dying. Uh, you know, often you are elected into office, or maybe you seize power, but, but it's not usually uh, this true passage anymore of uh, a family line. So it's a complicated moment for him. It's a complicated moment, and it's also, I mean, this is, this is dictated everything about his life. For 73 years, he's been told this would be his destiny. It decided, you know, whether um, his, his schooling at home, it, it dictated, you know, who he married with famously disastrous results the first time around. Um, it's, this has been so much leading up to this moment for Charles, and now you know, he's 73 when he becomes king. Is it the, the questions of how long of a time, you know, will he have to really shape a reign? What kind of legacy might he have? There's, you know, so much to look forward to. Mm. Rhonda Colvin, uh, let's go to you for reaction from President Biden, Rhonda. Yeah, President Biden and uh, Lady Jill, First Lady Jill Biden just put out their statement just seconds ago, really. I'm going through it, and this is probably one of the longest statements I've ever read from the White House. It's several paragra paragraphs long. Uh, he says, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was more than a monarch. She defined an era. Queen Elizabeth II was a stateswoman of unmatched dignity and constancy who depend, deepened the bedrock alliance between the U.S. and the United Kingdom. She helped to make our relationship special. She he then goes on to talk about the first time he met the Queen, and it was in 1982 when traveling to the U.K. as a part of a Senate delegation. Uh, and he adds that we were honored that she extended her hospitality to us in June 2021 during our first overseas trip as president and first lady, where she charmed us with her wit, moved us with her kindness, and gener generously shared with us her wisdom. Uh, and he continues on with his reflections. But again, this just came out from uh, the president on his reaction to hearing the news. And it's a, it's a very lengthy statement. And it's just a, it's probably a testament to uh, the type of loss that a lot of uh, global leaders uh, feel that this is right now. Hannah, what will you be watching in the coming hours and days? Well, I've just been uh, looking at how the British media is going to continue to cover this. And um, it's been announced that the, uh, the BBC, all BBC programming is going to obviously focus on this, including all BBC radio stations are going to be playing the same program until at least 7 a.m. tomorrow. And that's including, I have to say, not just obviously the news channels, but like the dance music channel, um, all of these things. Uh, really, you see this, this machine of the British media kicking into gear to cover this. Um, the other thing I'm thinking about is uh, just occurring to me that now the new second in line to the throne is now a nine-year-old, is now Prince George um, after William, who's 40. And you see how um, we've been talking about those, the buffers, how long that, that, that Charles himself has waited for this moment, um, how suddenly everyone else has now moved up in that line of succession um, without too many people between the current king and, and a nine-year-old boy. Um, and. Uh, Really, uh, as we discussed the sort of how, how will this, this 10 day, how will this commemoration really uh, mark ways that the, the royal family may try to continue to modernize? We've been speaking a little about this. How do they continue to prove their relevance to the public? How do they uh, continue the, to prove that they are, are worth the taxpayer money, are worth the, um, are worth the, the, the vast amount of land they, they own in Britain and collect rents on? Um, of course, uh, there's often an argument made about how, how the British royal family, you know, brings in the tourism money. People are so interested in that. But of course, you know, the, the buildings, the history, that all remains whether or not the royal family is also um, the head of state, is also playing this political role, is, is also has this, this official power that is, you know, ceremonial mostly, but technically also at the end of the day, not. Is that a, something that is going to last that much longer into this century? 
Thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, James Homan, final thoughts from you. In a rare sort of reflective mood during an address to the Commonwealth leaders in 2011 in Perth, Australia, Queen Elizabeth cited a, an aboriginal proverb to express her feelings. She said, we are all visitors to this time and this place. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. Queen Elizabeth wasn't just a bystander, she was a shaper of history. And today, the second Elizabethan age has ended. Mary Jordan is someone who has covered uh, Queen Elizabeth and her time. Final thoughts from you before we prepare to go off the air. Uh, and a reminder to our audience, we will be back many times over the coming days and weeks. Mary? I think when we think of her, so many of us, we think she was stoic. And, and those who met her uh, also knew she was a little mischievous. You know, she had this little twinkle in her eye. And I think when you see what's going on now, all eyes around the world on what happened, I think we know that there was a little bit of magic going on uh, with Queen Elizabeth. She took the throne at a t difficult time. She didn't want it. She went through wars and scandals and deaths. And she lasted until she was 96. And I think people give her a lot of credit for being a tough, somewhat mischievous lady. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you to all of our colleagues uh, all over who have contributed to our reporting today. You've been watching coverage live from the Washington Post as we brought you historic news that Queen Elizabeth II died today at her home in Balmoral, Scotland, surrounded by her family who rushed to be at her bedside. She was 96 years old. Flags across the UK are flying at half staff as the second Elizabethan age draws to a close. We'll bring you coverage over the next 10 days of reflection and ceremony as Charles assumes that mantle of King. We'll be live from London as the Queen's body is moved from Scotland to Buckingham Palace and world leaders gather for the Queen's funeral at Westminster Abbey. We leave you with this look back at an extraordinary life. The great sort of paradox of Queen Elizabeth's reign is that while she was the most visible figure on the public stage for as long as anybody, no one actually knew her. She felt that she was a symbol and that if she were to sort of become more familiar, that the magic would go. She was never predestined to become the queen, but her uncle, who was the older brother of her father, was due to become the king and became the king. That was Edward VIII. But there was a constitutional crisis in the 30s when he fell in love with an American divorcee. So he was forced to choose between her or the monarchy, and he chose her. And so at the age of 10, she suddenly became the next in line to the throne. When her father died, she was in Kenya. She came back to be greeted by this sort of phalanx of old men in top hat and tails. One of them was Churchill, who was her first prime minister. Those Britons had seen her father as the king, her uncle as the king, her grandfather as the king, her great-grandfather, Edward VII as the king, and even her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. television created these milestones of her monarchy. The first coronation to be televised and indeed watched by millions around the world. It was the first great global television event. So somebody at the BBC convinced them to do a documentary film. It was called The Royal Family. And it was the first real glimpse of them in their family environment. And Unfortunately, instead of it being sort of this candid and warm milestone in television history, what it actually did was sort of break down those barriers of inscrutability. 
Many people believe that it sort of led then to this whole notion of the press in the 70s, 80s, and 90s actually sort of turning on the royal family. They didn't turn on the queen herself, but they certainly went after her family. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. Diana died in 1997. The whole episode, you may remember, sort of cast the whole country into this grief and rage, really. And, uh, you know, at first the anger and despair turned on Prince Charles. But then it slowly gathered against the Queen, and it was really the only time in her reign that the public was losing support for her. She gave a very measured and clever television uh, address to the nation about Diana that was very sort of solicitous of her and uh, captured the moment. So what I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. As her reign progressed, I think the, the whole society saw that what they had with the Queen was a national treasure. When she took her office, there was still the semblance of a British Empire, and that obviously diminished greatly. One thing that isn't perhaps well understood about the Queen is that she was a very pious woman, and she saw her commitment to the monarchy as sort of a sacred promise she made to her God. During her reign, there were calls at various times for her to abdicate so that Charles, for example, then a young, you know, spirited bachelor could become the king, or, you know, when William came along, or when George was born. That sort of notion completely misreads who she was. What was driving her wasn't the trappings of being the queen and the luxury and all the rest of it. It was what she felt was her sacred duty to her subjects, to her people. She would never, ever have abdicated. She's reigned longer than any other British monarch, dating back 1,100 years. And no one thought that the reign of Queen Victoria, which lasted 63 years, would ever be surpassed, but Queen Elizabeth did achieve that in 2015. And she was this sort of continuous thread through incredible changes in British society. We've always associated the monarchy with Elizabeth. Now that dynamic changes, now that Charles is the king, that feeling towards the monarchy inevitably is going to change. And one has to sort of think that it's not going to be quite as solid as it was given Elizabeth's incredible reign and her duty to it.
Well, actually flying, it's not the flying ant, I think. Oh, no, midget. No, 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 no midget, just flying. Fly. flying Actual ant. flying. Yeah, we've done this earlier. Yeah. Oh, Happy to do it. <coughs> <coughs> is going to happen. We should just then carry that. Mm. Yeah, we should do it. Yeah, that will happen. If we're going to, we're just saying, 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 we're just Harry's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everything's dead. I can't I don't want to switch off because I don't want to mess my bed. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, it's a little bit.
Where's that camera? Oh, is it? I was trying to work, work it out. Oh, we need to be pointing in the right direction. church bells everywhere to ring for an hour tomorrow at noon. The church of England does. Yeah. Can I say that? Let's you can say that. Yeah. An hour, did you say? An hour? For an hour tomorrow at noon. Got it, yep. Okay. Yes, I've just been told actually that the Church of England has said that all church bells, they would like all church bells to ring at noon tomorrow for an hour.